Chapter 11 In which Charmaine kneels on a cake The shop was closed when Charmaine reached it, but she could see, dimly through the glass, someone moving about inside, cleaning up. Charmaine rapped on the door, and when that did no good, put her face to the glass and shouted, Let me in! The person inside at length shuffled over and opened the door enough to put his face round it. He proved to be an apprentice about Peter's age, whom Charmaine had never met. We're closed, he said. His eyes went to waif in Charmaine's arms. The open door had let out a gust of recent doughnut smells, and waif had her nose into it, sniffing rapturously. And we don't allow dogs, he said. I need to see my father, Charmaine said. You can't see anyone, the apprentice said. The bakehouse is still busy. My father is Mr. Baker, Charmaine told him, and I know he'll see me. Let me in. How do I know that's the truth? The apprentice said suspiciously. It's as much as my job's worth. Charmaine knew this was the sort of time when she needed to be polite and tactful, but she ran out of patience, just as she had with the kobolds. Oh, you silly boy, she interrupted him. If my father knew you weren't letting me in, he'd sack you on the spot. Go and fetch him if you don't believe me. Hoity-toity, said the apprentice, but he backed away from the door, saying, Come in, then, but you leave the dog outside, understand? No, I don't, Charmaine said. She might be stolen. She's a highly valuable magical dog. I'll have you know, and even the king lets her in. If he can, so can you. The apprentice looked scornful. Tell that to the lubbock on the hills, he said. Things might have become very difficult then, if Belle, one of the ladies who served in the shop, had not come in through the bakehouse door just then. She was tying on her headscarf and saying, I'm leaving now, Timmy. Mind you wash down all the... When she saw Charmaine. Oh, hello, Charmaine. Want to see your dad, do you? Hello, Belle. Yes, I do, Charmaine said but he won't let me bring Waif in. Belle looked at Waif. Her face melted into a smile. What a sweet little creature. But you know what your dad thinks of dogs coming in here. Better leave her in the shop for Timmy to look after. You'll take care of her, won't you, Timmy? The apprentice made a grudging noise and glowered at Charmaine. But I warn you, Charmaine, Belle continued in her usual chatty way. They're very busy through there. There's an order on for a special cake, so you won't stay long, will you? Put your little dog down here, and she'll be quite safe. And, Timmy, I want those shelves cleaned down properly this time, or I'll have words to say to you tomorrow. Ta-ra! Night-night! Belle swept out of the shop, and Charmaine swept past her into it. Charmaine did have thoughts of sweeping onward into the bakehouse with Waif, but she knew Waif's record with the food was not good. So she deposited Waif beside the counter, gave Timmy a cold nod, and he'll hate me for the rest of his life, she thought, and stalked on alone past the empty glass cases and the cool marble shelves and the clusters of white tables and chairs, where the citizens of High Norland were accustomed to sit for coffee and rich cakes. Waif gave a desperate whine as Charmaine pushed open the bakehouse door, but Charmaine hardened her heart and pushed the door shut behind herself. It was busy as a hive in there, and tropically hot, and full of scents that would certainly have driven Waif mad with greed. There was the smell of new dough and dough cooking, the sweet scent of buns and tarts and waffles, overlaid with savoury smells from pasties and quiches, which were all overlaid in turn by strong odours of cream and flavoured icing from the large, many-layered cake that several people were decorating on the table nearest the door. Rosewater, Charmaine thought, inhaling those scents. Lemon, strawberry, almonds from South Ingery, cherries and peaches. Mr. Baker was striding from worker to worker, instructing, encouraging and inspecting as he went. Jake, you have to put your back into kneading that dough, Charmaine heard him saying as she came in, and a moment later, a light hand with that pastry, Nancy, don't hammer it or it'll be like a rock. A moment after that, he was off down to the baking ovens at the other end, telling the young man there which oven to use, and wherever he went, 
he got instant attention and obedience. Her father, Charmaine knew, was a king in his bakehouse, more of a king than the real king in the royal mansion, she thought. His white hat sat on his head like a crown. It suited him, too, Charmaine thought. He was thin-faced and ginger-haired like she was herself, though much more freckly. She ran him down by the stoves, where he was tasting a savoury meat filling and telling the girl making it that there was too much spice in it. It tastes good, though, the girl protested. Maybe, said Mr. Baker, but there's a world of difference between a good taste and a perfect one, Lorna. You cut along and help them with the cake, or they'll be at it all night, and I'll have a go rescuing this filling. He took the saucepan off the flames as Lorna hurried off, looking mightily relieved. He turned round with it and saw Charmaine. Hello, sweetheart. I wasn't expecting you. A slight doubt came over him. Did your mother send you? No, Charmaine said. I came by myself. I'm looking after Great Uncle William's house, remember? Oh, so you are, her father said. What can I do for you? Uh, Charmaine said. This was hard to say now that she had been reminded what an expert her father was. He said, just a moment, and turned to search through rows of powdered herbs and spices on a shelf beside the stoves. He selected a jar, uncapped it, and shook just a sprinkle of something into the saucepan. He stirred the mixture, tasted it, and nodded. That'll do now, he said, putting the saucepan down to cool. Then he looked questioningly at Charmaine. I don't know how to cook, Dad, she blurted out, and the food for the evening comes raw in Great Uncle William's house. You don't happen to have any instructions written down, do you? For apprentices or something? Mr. Baker pulled at his freckly chin with his clean, clean hand, thinking. I always told your mother you'd need to know some of those things, he said, respectable or not. Let's see. Most of what I've got will be a bit advanced for you. Patisserie and gourmet sauces and such. I expect my apprentices to come to me knowing the basics these days but I think I still may have some of the elementary simple notes from back when I started. Let's go and see, shall we? He led the way across the bakehouse, among the thronging busy cooks to the far wall. There were a few rickety shelves there, piled higgledy-piggledy with notebooks, pieces of paper with jam stains on them, and fat files covered with flowery fingerprints. Wait a moment, Mr. Baker said pausing by the leftovers table beside these shelves. I'd better give you some food to go on with while you're reading up on it, hadn't I? Charmaine knew this table well. Waif would have loved it. On it were any pieces of baking that had not turned out quite perfect. Broken tarts, lopsided buns and cracked pasties, together with all the things from the shop that had not been sold that day. The bakehouse workers were allowed to carry these home if they wanted. Mr. Baker picked up one of the sacking bags the workers used and began swiftly filling it. A whole cream cake went in at the bottom, followed by a layer of pasties, then buns, doughnuts, and finally a large cheese flan. He left the bulging bag on the table while he searched about on the shelves. Here we are, he said pulling forth a floppy brown notebook, dark with old grease. I thought I still had it. This was from when I started as a lad in the restaurant on Marketplace. I was as ignorant as you are then, so it should be just what you need. Do you want the spells that go with the recipes? Spells, said Charmaine. But, Dad... Mr. Baker looked as guilty as Charmaine had ever seen him. His freckles, for a moment, were drowned in redness. Oh, no, I know, Charmaine. Your mother would have seventy fits. She will insist that magic is low, vulgar stuff. But I was born a magic user, and I can't help myself, not when I'm cooking. We use magic all the time here in the bakehouse. Be a good, kind girl and don't let your mother know, please. He pulled a thin yellow notebook off the shelves and flapped it wistfully. These in here are all plain, simple spells that work. Do you want this? Yes, please, Charmaine said. And of course I won't say a word to Mother. I know what she's like as well as you do. Good girl, 
said Mr. Baker. He swiftly slid both notebooks down into the bag beside the cheese flan and passed Charmaine the bag. They grinned at one another like conspirators. Happy eating, Mr. Baker said. Good luck. You too, Charmaine said. And thank you, Dad. She stretched up and kissed him on his flowery, freckled cheek, just below the cook's hat, and then made her way out of the bakehouse. You lucky thing! Lorna called out to her while Charmaine was pushing open the door. I had my eye on that cream cake he gave you. There were two of them, Charmaine called over her shoulder as she went through into the shop. There, to her surprise, she found Timmy sitting on the glass and marble counter with Waif in his arms. He explained rather defensively. She was really upset when you left her, started howling her head off. Perhaps we won't be lifelong enemies after all, Charmaine thought, as Waif leapt out of Timmy's arms, shrieking with delight. She danced about Charmaine's ankles and generally made such a noise that Timmy evidently did not hear Charmaine thank him. Charmaine made sure to give a great smile and to nod at him as she went out into the street, with Waif frisking and squeaking round her feet. The shop and bakehouse were on the other side of the town from the river and the embankment. Charmaine could have cut across to there, but it was shorter, with Waif having to walk, because Charmaine was carrying the bulging bag, to go along High Street instead. High Street, although it was one of the main streets, was far from seeming that way. It was twisting and narrow, with no sidewalks, but the shops on either side were some of the best. Charmaine walked slowly along, looking into shops to give Waif time to keep up, dodging late shoppers and people just strolling before supper, and thinking. Her thoughts were divided between satisfaction, Peter has no excuse now for making any more horrible food, and amazement. Dad is a magic user. He always has been. Up until then... Charmaine had felt a lot of hidden guilt at the way she had experimented with the bulk of palimpsest. But she found that had gone now. I think I may have inherited Dad's magic. Oh, great! Then I know I can do spells. But why does Dad always do what Mother says? He insists on me being respectable as much as Mother does. Honestly, parents... Charmaine found she was feeling very jolly altogether about this. At this point, there was a tremendous clatter of horse hooves coming up behind her, mixed with rumbling and deep shouts of, Clear the way! Clear the way! Charmaine glanced round and found riders in some kind of uniform filling the street, coming so fast that they were almost on top of her already. People on foot were flattening themselves against shops and walls on either side of the street. Charmaine whirled round, reaching for Waif. She tripped over someone's doorstep and half knelt on the bag of food. But she got Waif and managed not to drop the bag. Holding Waif and the bag in both arms, she backed against the nearest wall, while horses' legs and men's feet in stirrups pounded past in front of her nose. Those were followed by a whole string more of galloping horses, shining black ones in long leather traces, and a whip cracking across their backs. After them, a great colourful coach thundered by, glinting with gold and glass and painted shields, with two men in feathered hats swaying on the back of it. This was followed by yet more uniforms on horses, galloping deafeningly. Then they were gone, away down the street and round the next bend. Waif whimpered. Charmaine sagged against the wall. What on earth was that? She said to the person flattened against the wall beside her. That, said the woman, was Crown Prince Ludovic, on his way to visit the king, I suppose. She was a fair and slightly fierce-looking lady, who reminded Charmaine just a little of Sophie Pendragon. She was clutching a small boy who might have reminded Charmaine of Morgan, except that he was not making any noise at all. He looked to be shocked white, rather the way Charmaine felt herself. He ought to know better than to go that fast in a narrow street like this, Charmaine said angrily. Someone could have been hurt. She looked into her bag and discovered that the flan had broken in half and folded up, 
which made her angrier than ever. Why couldn't he have gone down the embankment where it's wide, she said. Doesn't he care? Not a lot, said the woman. Then I shudder to think what he'll be like when he's king, Charmaine said. He's going to be dreadful. The woman gave her a strange, meaningful stare. I didn't hear you say that, she said. Why? asked Charmaine. Ludovic doesn't like criticism, the woman said. He has lubberkins to enforce his feelings. Lubberkins, you hear, girl? Let's hope I was the only one who heard what you said. She heaved the little boy higher in her arms and walked away. Charmaine thought about this as she trudged through the town with Waif under one arm and the bag pulling at the other. She found herself hoping hard that her king, Adolphus X, would go on living for a very long time. Or I might have to start a revolution, she thought. And my goodness, it feels a long way to Great Uncle William's house today. She got there in the end, however, and put Waif down thankfully on the garden path. Indoors, Peter was in the kitchen, sitting on one of the ten bags of laundry, staring moodily at a big red slab of meat on the table. Beside it were three onions and two carrots. I don't know how to cook these, he said. You don't have to, Charmaine said, dumping her bag on the table. I went to see my father this evening. And here, she added, fishing out the two notebooks, are recipes and the spells that go with them. Both notebooks were rather the worse for flan. Charmaine wiped them on her skirt and handed them over. Peter brightened up wonderfully and jumped off the laundry bag. That's really useful, he said, and a bag of food is better. Charmaine unpacked bent flan, broken pasties and squashed buns. The cream cake at the bottom had a knee-shaped dent in it, and it had oozed into some of the pasties. This made her angry with Prince Ludovic all over again. She told Peter all about it while she tried to reassemble the pasties. Yes, my mother says he's got the makings of a real tyrant, Peter said a little absently, because he was flipping through the notebooks. She says that's why she left this country. Do I do these spells while I cook the food or before or after? Do you know? Dad didn't say. You'll have to work it out, Charmaine said, and went away to Great Uncle William's study to find a soothing book to read. The twelve-branched wand was interesting, but it made her feel as though her mind had broken into a hundred little pieces. Each branch of the wand had twelve more branches growing out of it, and twelve more from each of those. Much more and I'd turn into a tree, Charmaine thought as she searched the shelves. She chose a book called The Magician's Journey, which she hoped would be an adventure story. And it was, in a way, but she very soon realized that it was also a step-by-step -step account of how a magician learned his skills. This set her thinking again of how Dad had turned out to be a magic user. And I know I've inherited it, she thought. I learned to fly, and I mended the pipes in the bathroom all in no time. But I ought to learn how to do it smoothly and quietly, instead of shouting and bullying things. She was still sitting, pondering this, when Peter yelled to her to come and eat. I used the spells, he said. He was very proud of himself. He had warmed up the pasties and made a truly tasty mixture of the onions and carrots. And, he added, I was quite tired after a day of exploring. Looking for gold, Charmaine said. It's the natural thing to do, Peter said. We know it's somewhere in this house, but what I found instead was the place where the kobolds live. It's like a huge cave, and they were all in there making things. Cuckoo clocks, mostly, but some of them were making teapots, and some more were making something like a sofa near the entrance. I didn't speak to them. I didn't know if they were in the past or nowadays, so I just smiled and watched. I didn't want them angry again. What did you do today? Oh, goodness, Charmaine said. It was quite a day. It started with Twinkle out on the roof. I was so scared. 
and she told him all the rest. Peter frowned. This twinkle, he said, and this Sophie. Are you quite sure they're not up to something sinister? Wizard Norland said fire demons were dangerous beings, you know. I did wonder, Charmaine admitted, but I think they're all right. It looks as if Princess Hilda has called them in to help. I wish I knew how to find what the king is looking for. He got so excited when I found that family tree. Did you know that Prince Ludovic has eight second cousins, mostly called Hans and Isola, and nearly all of them have met with sticky ends? Because they were all bad lots, Peter said. My mother says that Hans the Cruel was poisoned by Isola the murderess, and she was killed by Hans the Drunkard when he was drunk. Then that Hans fell downstairs and broke his neck. His sister Isola was hanged over in Strangia for trying to kill the lord she married there. How many am I up to? Five, said Charmaine, quite fascinated. Three to go. Those are two Matildas and another Hans, Peter said. Hans Nicholas, that one was, and I don't know how he died, except that he was somewhere abroad when he did. One of the Matildas was burned when her manor house caught fire, and they say the other one is such a dangerous witch that Prince Ludovic has her shut up in an attic in Castle Schwa. Nobody dares go near her, not even Prince Ludovic. She kills people just by looking at them. Is it all right that I gave way for that lump of meat? Probably, said Charmaine, if she didn't choke. How do you know all about these cousins? I'd never heard of them before today. That's because I come from Montalbino, Peter said. Everyone at my school knows all about the nine bad cousins of High Norland. But I suppose that in this country neither the king nor Prince Ludovic wanted to get about that their relatives were so vile. They say... Prince Ludovic is as bad as the rest, too. And we're such a nice country, really, Charmaine protested. She felt quite hurt that her own high Norland should have given birth to nine such awful people. It seemed hard on the king as well. Chapter 12 Concerns Laundry and Lubbock Eggs Charmaine woke early the following day, because Waif stuck her small cold nose into Charmaine's ear, obviously thinking they needed to go to the royal mansion as usual. No, I don't need to go, Charmaine said crossly. The king has to look after Prince Ludovic today. Go away, Waif, or I may turn into an Isola and poison you, or a Matilda and do evil magic at you. Just go. Waif pattered sadly away. But Charmaine was awake by then. Before long she got up, soothing her crossness by promising herself that she would spend a fine, lazy day reading The Magician's Journey. Peter was up too, and he had other ideas. We're going to do some of this laundry today, he said. Have you noticed that there are ten bags of it in here now and ten more in Wizard Norland's bedroom? I think there may be ten in the pantry as well. Charmaine glowered at the laundry bags. She could not deny that they filled the kitchen up, rather. Let's not bother, she said. It must be those kobolds doing it. No, it isn't, Peter said. My mother says that laundry breeds if you don't wash it. We have a washerwoman, Charmaine said. I don't know how to wash things. I'll show you how, Peter said. Stop hiding behind your ignorance angrily wondering how it was that Peter always managed to set her to work. Charmaine shortly found herself pumping hard at the pump in the yard, filling buckets with water for Peter to carry to the wash house and empty into the great copper boiler. After about the tenth bucketful, Peter came back, saying, We need to light the fire under the copper now, but I can't find any fuel. Where do you think he keeps it? Charmaine wiped sweaty hair back from her face with an exhausted hand. It must work like the kitchen fire, she said. I'll go and see. She led the way to the shed, thinking, and if this doesn't work, we can stop trying. Good. 
We need just one thing that will burn, she told Peter. He looked blankly around. Inside the shed there was nothing but a stack of wooden tubs and a box of soap flakes. Charmaine eyed the place at the bottom of the boiler. It was black with old fires. She eyed the tubs. Too big. She eyed the soap flakes and decided not to risk another storm of bubbles. She went outside and plucked a twig from the unhealthy tree. Shoving this into the blackened fireplace, she slapped the side of the boiler and said, Fire! and had to leap quickly backward as flames thundered into being underneath. There, she said to Peter. Good, he said. Back to the pump. We need the copper full now. Why? said Charmaine. Because there's thirty sacks of washing, of course, Peter said. We'll need to run hot water into some of these tubs to soak the silks and do the woolens in, and then we'll need water for rinsing. Buckets and buckets more. I don't believe this. Charmaine muttered to Waif, who was pottering about watching. She sighed and went back to pumping. Meanwhile, Peter fetched out a kitchen chair and put it in the shed. Then, to Charmaine's indignation, he set out the tubs in a row and began pouring bucketfuls of her hard-worked-for cold water into them. I thought those were for the copper, she protested. Peter climbed on the chair and began hurling handfuls of soap flakes into the top of the boiler. It was now steaming and making simmering noises. Stop arguing and keep pumping, he said. It's nearly hot enough for the whites now. Four more buckets should do it, and then you can start putting shirts and things in. He climbed off the chair and went away into the house. When he came back, he was lugging two of the laundry bags, which he left propped against the shed while he went back for more. Charmaine pumped and panted and glowered, and climbed on the chair to pour her four full buckets into the soapy clouds of steam rising from the copper. Then, glad to be doing something else, she untied the strings that held the first laundry bag closed. There were socks inside, and a red wizardly robe, two pairs of trousers, and shirts and underclothes below that, all smelling of mildew from Peter's bathroom flood. Oddly enough, when Charmaine untied the second bag, there were the same identical things inside it. Wizard's washing was bound to be peculiar, Charmaine said. She took armfuls of the washing, climbed on the chair, and heaved the clothes into the copper. No, 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 stop! Peter shouted, just as Charmaine had emptied the second bag full in. He came rushing across the grass, towing eight more bags all tied together. But you said to do it, Charmaine protested. Not before we've sorted it out, you fool, Peter said. You only boil the white things. I didn't know, Charmaine said sullenly. She spent the rest of the morning sorting laundry into heaps on the grass, while Peter hurled shirts into boil and ran off soapy water into tubs to soak robes and socks and twenty pairs of wizardly trousers in. At length he said, I think the shirts are boiled enough and pulled forward a swilling tub of cold water. You put the fire out while I run the hot water off. Charmaine had not the least idea how you put a magical fire out. Experimentally, she slapped the side of the copper. It burned her hand. She said, Ow! Fire! Go out! in a sort of scream, and the fire obediently flickered down and disappeared. She sucked her fingers and watched Peter open the tap at the bottom of the copper and send steaming pink suds gushing away down the drain. Charmaine peered through the steam as the tap ran. I didn't know the soap was pink, she said. It wasn't, Peter said. Oh, my heavens, look what you've done now. He leapt up on the chair and began heaving out steaming shirts with a fork stick meant for the purpose. Every one of them, as it splashed into the cold water, turned out to be bright cherry pink. After the shirts, he forked out fifteen tiny shrunken socks, all of which would have been too small for Morgan, and a baby-sized pair of wizardly trousers. Finally, he fished up a very small red robe and held it out accusingly, dripping and steaming for Charmaine to see. That's what you did, he said. 
You never put red wool in with white shirts. The dye runs, and it's turned out almost too small for a cobalt. You are an utter fool. How was I to know? Charmaine demanded passionately. I've lived a sheltered life. Mother never lets me go near our wash house, because it's not respectable. I know. Peter said disgustedly. I suppose you think I should be sorry for you. Well, I'm not. I'm not going to trust you anywhere near the mangle. The Lord knows what you'd do with that. I'm going to try a bleaching spell while I do the mangling. You go and get the clothesline and that tub of clothes pegs from the pantry and hang everything up to dry. Can I trust you not to hang yourself or something while you do that? I'm not a fool," Charmaine said haughtily. An hour or so later, when Peter and Charmaine, both weary and damp with steam, were soberly chewing yesterday's leftover pasties in the kitchen, Charmaine could not help thinking that her efforts with the clothesline were rather more successful than Peter's with the mangle and the bleaching spell. The clothesline zigzagged ten times back and forth across the yard, but it stayed up. The shirts now flapping from the pegs on it were not white. Some were streaked with red, some had curious pink curlicues all over them, and some others were a delicate blue. Most of the robes had white stripes on them somewhere. The socks and the trousers were all creamy white. Charmaine thought it very tactful of her that she did not point out to Peter that the elf, who was ducking and dodging among the zigzags of washing, was staring at it in grave amazement. There's an elf out there," Peter exclaimed with his mouth full. Charmaine swallowed the rest of her pasty and opened the back door to see what the elf wanted. The elf bent his tall, fair head under the doorway and stalked into the middle of the kitchen, where he put the glass box he was carrying down on the table. Inside the box were three roundish white things about the size of tennis balls. Peter and Charmaine stared at them. And then at the elf, who simply stood there without speaking. What are these? Peter said at length. The elf bowed very slightly. These, he said, are the three lubbock eggs that we have removed from the wizard William Norland. It was a very difficult operation, but we have performed it successfully. Lubbock eggs! Peter and Charmaine exclaimed almost together. Charmaine felt her face draining white, and very much wished she had not eaten that pasty. All Peter's freckles showed up brown in his white face. Waif, who had been begging for lunch under the table, set up a frantic whining. "Why,、uh, why have you brought the eggs here?" Charmaine managed to say. The elf said calmly, "Because we have found it impossible to destroy them. They defeat all our efforts, magical and physical." We have finally concluded that only a fire demon is capable of destroying them. Wizard Norland informs us that Miss Charming will by now have contact with a fire demon. Wizard Norland's alive. He's talking to you, Peter said eagerly. Indeed, said the elf. He is recovering well and should be ready to return here in three or four days at the most. Oh, I'm so glad, Charmaine said. So it was Lubbock eggs making him ill. That is so, the elf agreed. It seems that the wizard encountered a Lubbock some months ago while walking in a mountain meadow. The fact that he is a wizard has caused the eggs to absorb his magic and become nearly impossible to destroy. You are warned not to touch the eggs or attempt to open this box that they are in. They are extremely dangerous. You are advised to obtain the services of the fire demon as soon as possible. While Peter and Charmaine gulped and stared at those three white eggs in their box, the elf gave another small bow and stalked away through the inner door. Peter pulled himself together and ran after him, shouting to know more. But he arrived in the living room to see the front door slamming shut. When he, followed by Charmaine, followed by Waif. Rushed out into the front garden, there was no sign of the elf at all. Charmaine caught sight of Rollo peering slyly round the stalks of a hydrangea, but the elf was gone completely. 
she picked up Waif and planted her in Peter's arms. Peter, she said, keep Waif here. I'll go and get Calcifer at once. And she set off at a run down the garden path. Be quick, Peter shouted after her. Be very quick. Charmaine did not need Peter to tell her that. She ran, followed by Waif's despairing and squeaky howls, and ran and went on running until she had rounded the great cliff and could see the town ahead. There she had to drop to a hasty walk and clutch at the stitch in her side, but she kept on as fast as she could. The thought of those round white eggs sitting on the kitchen table was enough to make her break into a trot as soon as her breath came back. Suppose the eggs hatched before she'd found Calcifer. Suppose Peter did something stupid, like trying to put a spell on them. Suppose she tried to take her mind off all the other awful possibilities by panting to herself. I am so stupid. I could have asked that elf what the elf gift was, but I clean forgot. I should have remembered. I'm stupid. But her heart was not really in it. All she could see in her mind was Peter mumbling spells over the glass box. It would be just like him to try. It came on to pour with rain as she entered the town. Charmaine was pleased. That should take Peter's mind off the Lubbock eggs. He would have to rush outside and bring the washing in before it got soaked again. Just so long as he hadn't done something stupid before that. She arrived at the royal mansion soaked through and almost out of breath entirely where she clattered at the knocker and rang the bell even more frantically than she had when Twinkle was on the roof. It seemed an age before Sim opened the door. Oh, Sim, she gasped. I need to see Calcifer at once. Can you tell me where he is? Certainly, miss, Sim replied, not in the least put out by Charmaine's soaking hair and dripping clothes. Sir Calcifer is presently in the Grand Lounge. Allow me to show you the way. He shut the door and shuffled off, and Charmaine dripped her way after him, down the long damp hallway, past the stone staircase, to a grand doorway somewhere near the back of the mansion, where Charmaine had never been before. In here, miss, he said, throwing the grand but shabby door open. Charmaine went in, to a roar of voices and a crowd of finely dressed people who all seemed to be shouting at one another while they walked about eating cake off elegant little plates. The cake was the first thing she recognized. It stood grandly on a special table in the middle of the room. Although only half of it was there by now, it was definitely the same cake that her father's cooks had been working on yesterday evening. It was like seeing an old friend among all these finely dressed strangers. The nearest man, who was dressed in midnight blue velvet and dark blue brocade, turned and stared haughtily at Charmaine, and then exchanged disgusted looks with the lady beside him. This lady was wearing, not exactly a ball dress, not at tea time, Charmaine thought, Silks and satin so sumptuous that she would have made Aunt Sempronia look shabby had Aunt Sempronia been there. Aunt Sempronia was not there, but the Lord Mayor was, and so was his lady, and so were all the most important people in town. Sim, asked the man in midnight blue, just who is this wet little commoner? Lady Charming. Sim replied, is the new assistant to his majesty, your highness. He turned to Charmaine. Allow me to present you to his highness, Crown Prince Ludovic, my lady. He stepped backward and shut himself outside the room. Charmaine felt that the floor would be doing her a favour if it opened under her soaking wet feet and dropped her into the cellars. She had clean forgotten the visit of Crown Prince Ludovic. Princess Hilda had obviously invited all the best people of High Norland to meet the prince, and she, ordinary Charmaine Baker, had gate-crashed the tea party. Pleased to meet you, your highness, she tried to say. It came out as a frightened whisper. Prince Ludovic probably did not hear. 
He laughed and said, Is Lady Charming some kind of nickname the king calls you, little girl? He pointed with his cake fork at the lady in not-quite-evening dress. I call my assistant Lady Moneybags. She costs me a fortune, you see. Charmaine opened her mouth to explain what her name really was, but the lady in not-quite-evening dress got in first. You'd no call to say that, she said angrily. You spiteful thing, you. Prince Ludovic laughed and turned away to talk to the colourless gentleman, who was approaching in a colourless grey silk outfit. Charmaine would have tiptoed away at once to find Calcifer, except that, as the prince turned, the light from the big chandelier overhead caught him in side face. The eye she could see glowed deep purple. Charmaine stood like a cold statue of horror. Prince Ludovic was a lubberkin. For a moment she could not move, knowing she was showing her horror, knowing that people would see how horrified she was and wonder why. The colourless gentleman was already looking at her with curiosity in his mild mauve eyes. Oh, heavens! He was a lubberkin too! That was what had worried her before, when she met him near the kitchens. Fortunately, the Lord Mayor moved away from beside the cake table just then to bow deeply to the king and gave Charmaine a glimpse of a rocking horse. No, there were many rocking horses, Charmaine saw. It quite distracted her from her horror. For some reason, rocking horses were lined up all round the walls of the grand room. Twinkle was sitting on the one nearest to the large marble fireplace, staring at her earnestly. Charmaine could tell he knew she had had a shock of some kind and wanted her to tell him what had caused it. She began edging her way across to the fireplace. This gave her a sight of Morgan sitting by the marble fender playing with a box of bricks. Sophie was standing over him. In spite of Sophie's peacock blue dress and her air of being part of the tea party, Charmaine had a moment when she saw Sophie as a very large lioness with its teeth bared, standing guard on its small lion cub. Oh, hello, Charming, Princess Hilda said, more or less in Charmaine's ear. Would you like some cake, since you're here? Charmaine shot a regretful look at the cake and inhaled its luscious smell instead. No, thank you, ma'am, she said. I only came with a message for, uh, Mrs. Pendragon, you see. Where was Calcifer? Well, there she is, just over there, Princess Hilda said, pointing. I must say, the children are behaving beautifully at the moment. Long may it last. She swished away to offer another finely dressed person some cake. For all its swishing, her dress was nothing like as fine as the others in the room. It was faded almost white in places, and reminded Charmaine rather of the laundry after Peter had worked his bleaching spell. Oh, please don't let Peter try any spells on those lubber eggs, Charmaine prayed as she walked over to Sophie. Hello, Sophie said, smiling rather tensely. Beyond her, Twinkle was rocking on the rocking horse, going creak, 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 quite irritatingly. The fat nursemaid was standing beside him, going, Master Twinkle, pray do get down from there. You're making such a noise, Master Twinkle. Master Twinkle, I don't want to have to tell you twice. Over and over. This was probably even more irritating. Sophie knelt down and passed Morgan a red brick. Morgan held the brick out toward Charmaine. Boo brick, he told her. Charmaine knelt down too. No, it isn't blue, she said. Try again. Sophie murmured out of the side of her mouth. Glad to see you. I don't care for this prince at all, do you? Nor for that overdressed floozy with him. Purple? Morgan guessed, holding the brick out again. I don't blame you, Charmaine whispered to Sophie. No, it's not purple, it's red. But the prince is purple. Or his eyes are. He's a lubberkin. A what? Sophie said, puzzled. Dead? asked Morgan 
looking at his brick disbelievingly. Creak, creak, went the rocking horse. Yes, red, said Charmaine. I can't explain here. Tell me where Calcifer is. I'll explain to him and he can tell you. I need Calcifer urgently. Here I am, Calcifer said. What do you need me for? Charmaine looked round. Calcifer was roosting among the flaming logs in the fireplace, mingling his blue flames with the orange ones from the logs and looking so peaceful that Charmaine had quite failed to notice him until he spoke. Oh, thank goodness, she said. Can you come with me at once to Wizard Norland's house? We've got an emergency there that only a fire demon can deal with. Please. Chapter 13 In Which Calcifer Is Very Active Calcifer's orange eyes turned to Sophie. Do you need me to keep guard here still? He asked her. Or can you manage with just the two of you? Sophie gazed worriedly out at the well-dressed, chattering crowd. I don't think anyone's going to try anything just now, she said. But come back quickly. I have a horrible foreboding feeling. I don't trust that mauve-eyed fellow an inch, or that nasty prince either. All right, quick it is, Calcifer crackled. Stand up, young Charming. I'm going to sit on your hands. Charmaine got to her feet, expecting to be burned, or at least singed, any moment. Morgan objected to her, going by waving a yellow brick at her and raising a booming shout of, Green! 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 Shush! Sophie and Twinkle said together, and the fat nursemaid added, Master Morgan, we don't shout, not here in front of the king. It's yellow, Charmaine said, waiting for all the staring faces to turn away. She was beginning to see that none of the fine guests knew that Calcifer was part of the fire, and that Calcifer wanted to keep it that way. As soon as everyone lost interest and turned back to their chatter, Calcifer hopped up out of the fire and landed just slightly above Charmaine's nervous fingers in the exact likeness of a plate of cake. He did not hurt a bit. In fact, Charmaine could scarcely feel him. Clever, she said. Pretend to hold me, Calcifer replied, and walk out of the room with me. Charmaine curled her fingers round the false plate and walked toward the door. Prince Ludovic, to her relief, had moved away, but the king was coming toward her instead. He nodded and smiled at Charmaine. Got yourself some cake, I see, he said. Good, isn't it? Wish I knew why we have all these rocking horses. Don't happen to know, do you? Charmaine shook her head and the king turned away, still smiling. Why do we? Charmaine asked. Have all these rocking horses? Protection, said the plate of cake. Open the door and let's get out of here. Charmaine took one hand from the false plate, opened the door and slipped out into the damp, echoing hallway. But who's being protected from what? she asked, closing the door as quietly as possible. Morgan, said the plate of cake. Sophie got an anonymous note this morning. It said, Stop your investigation and leave High Norland or your child suffers. But we can't leave because Sophie's promised the princess she'll stay until we find out where all the money's gone. Tomorrow we're going to pretend to go. Carcifer was interrupted by shrill barking. Waif came dashing round the corner and hurled herself delightedly onto Charmaine's ankles. Carcifer jumped and floated free in his own shape as a fiery blue teardrop hovering by Charmaine's shoulder. Charmaine scooped Waif up. How did you... she began, trying to keep her face out of the way of Waif's eager tongue. Then she realised that Waif was not in the least wet. Oh, Calcifer, she must have come the quick way through the house. Can you find me the conference room? I can get us back from there. Easy. Calcifer darted off like a blue comet so fast that Charmaine had trouble keeping up. 
He whirled round several corners and into the corridor where the kitchen smells were. In next to no time, Charmaine was standing with her back to the door of the conference room, with Waif in her arms and Calcifer floating by her shoulder, while she tried to remember just what you did from here. Calcifer said, It's like this, and zigzagged away in front of her. Charmaine followed as best she could and found herself in the corridor where the bedrooms were. Sunlight was blazing in the window beyond Great Uncle William's study. Peter came dashing toward them, looking pale and urgent. Oh, good dog, Waif, he said. I sent her to fetch you. Just come and take a look at this. He turned and galloped back to the other end of the corridor, where he pointed rather shakily at the view out of the window. Out in the mountain meadow, the rain was just passing away in big melting dark grey clouds that were obviously still raining below on the town. A rainbow arched across the mountains, lurid in front of the clouds and pale and misty across the meadow. The meadow grass blazed and twinkled so with sunlit wetness that Charmaine was dazzled for a moment and could not see what Peter was pointing at. That's the Lubbock, Peter said rather hoarsely. Right? The Lubbock was there, towering, huge and purple in the middle of the meadow. It was bending slightly to listen to a kobold who was hopping up and down, pointing at the rainbow and evidently shouting at the Lubbock. That's the Lubbock, all right, Charmaine said, shivering. And that's Rolo. As she said it, the Lubbock laughed and rolled its bundles of insect eyes toward the rainbow. It stepped carefully backward until the misty rainbow stripe seemed to be right beside its insect feet. There, it bent and dragged a small earthenware pot out of the turf. Rolo capered about. That must be the crock of gold at the end of the rainbow, Peter said wonderingly. They watched the Lubbock pass the pot to Rolo, who took it in both arms. It was evidently heavy. Rolo stopped capering and staggered about with his head thrown back in greedy joy. He turned to stagger away. He did not see the Lubbock slyly extend its long purple proboscis behind him. He did not seem to notice when the proboscis stabbed into his back. He just sank away into the meadow grass, still clutching the pot and laughing. The Lubbock laughed too, standing in the middle of the meadow and waving its insect arms. It's just laid its eggs in Rolo, Charmaine whispered, and he didn't even notice. She felt ill. The same thing had so nearly happened to her. Peter looked quite green, and Waif was shivering. You know, she said, I think the Lubbock may have promised Rolo a crock of gold for making trouble between the kobolds and Great Uncle William. I'm sure it did, Peter said. Before you got here, I could hear Rolo yelling that he needed to be paid. He opened the window to listen, Charmaine thought. The silly fool. I have to declare war, Calcifer said. He had gone rather wispy and pale. He added in a small hiss that trembled slightly, I have to fight that Lubbock, or I won't deserve the life that Sophie gave me. One moment. He stopped speaking and hung in the air, long and stiff with his orange eyes closed. Are you the fire demon? Peter asked. I've never seen one bef- Quiet, said Calcifer. I'm concentrating. This has to be right. There was a slight rumbling from somewhere. Then overhead and across the window from behind came what Charmaine at first took for a thundercloud. It threw a large black turreted shadow along the meadow which very quickly reached the rejoicing Lubbock. The Lubbock looked round as the shadow fell across it and froze for an instant. Then it started to run. By this time, the turreted shadow had been followed by the castle that was making it, a tall black castle built of huge blocks of dark stone with turrets on all four corners. They could see the big stones it was made of shaking and grinding together as it moved, it came after the Lubbock faster than the Lubbock could run. The Lubbock dodged. The castle swerved after it. The Lubbock spread its small fuzzy wings for more speed and went bounding in furious strides to the tall rocks at the end of the meadow. 
As soon as it reached the rocks, it turned round and came rushing the other way toward the window. It must have hoped that the castle would crash into the rocks, but the castle reversed itself with no trouble at all and came after it faster than ever. Big puffs of black smoke went belching from the castle's turrets and floating away across the fading rainbow. The lubbock swiveled one of its multiple eyes as it ran, then put its insect head down and pelted, feelers flapping, wings beating, in a big curve that took it along the very edge of the cliff. Although its wings were now purple blurs, it seemed not to be able to fly with them at all. Charmaine understood why it had not tried to follow her down from the cliff. It would not have been able to fly back up. Instead of jumping off the cliff to escape, the lubbock simply kept on running, tempting the castle to follow and fall off the edge. The castle did follow. It came steaming and puffing and grinding at speed along the cliff and seemed perfectly balanced, in spite of the way half of it was hanging over the edge. The lubbock gave out a despairing hoot, changed direction again, and rushed out into the centre of the meadow. There it played its last trick and went small. It shrank into a tiny purple insect and plunged in among the grass and flowers. The castle was on to that spot in instants. It shuddered to a stop over the place where the lubbock had vanished and floated there. Flames began to come out of its flat underside. Yellow flames first, then orange, then angry red, and finally a white hotness that was too bright to look at. Flames and thick smoke licked up its sides and joined the dark smoke streaming from its turrets. The meadow filled with hot black fog. For what seemed hours, but was probably only minutes, the castle was a dim, hovering shape over smoky brightness, like the sun seen through clouds. They could hear the roar of burning even behind the magical window. Right, Calcifer said, I think that's done it. He turned to Charmaine, and she noticed that his eyes were now a strange, shining silver. Will you open the window, please? I have to go and make sure. As Charmaine turned the catch and swung the window open, the castle rose up and moved sideways. All the smokes and fogs collected into one large, dark puff, which rolled across the edge of the cliff and out into the valley, where it shredded away to nothing. When Calcifer floated forward into the meadow, the castle was standing demurely, with only a wisp of smoke coming from each turret, beside a big square patch of black earth. A perfectly horrible smell rolled in through the window. Ugh, said Charmaine, what is that? Roast lubbock, I hope, Peter said. They watched Calcifer float to the burned square. There he became a blue streak of action, whirling this way and that across the blackness until he had covered every tiny scrap of it. He came floating back with his eyes a normal orange again. That's it, he said cheerfully. Gone. And so are a lot of flowers, Charmaine thought, but it did not seem polite to say so. The important thing was that the lubbock was gone, truly gone. The flowers will grow again next year, Calcifer said to her. What did you come and fetch me for? This lubbock? No, the lubbock eggs, Peter and Charmaine said together. They explained about the elf and what the elf had said. Show me, said Calcifer. They went to the kitchen, all except Waif, who whined and refused to go in there. There Charmaine had a fine sunlit view of the yard out of the window full of dripping pink, white and red laundry still on the clotheslines. Peter had obviously not bothered to fetch it in. She wondered what he had been doing. The glass box was still on the table, still with the eggs in it, but it had sunk into the table somehow, so that only half of it was showing. What made it do that? Charmaine asked. The magic in the eggs. Peter looked a little self-conscious. Not exactly, he said. That happened when I put my safety spell on it. I was going back to the study to look up another spell when I saw Rollo talking to the Lubbock. Isn't that typical, Charmaine thought. This fool always thinks he knows best. 
The elf spells would have been quite enough, Carcifer said, floating above the embedded glass box. But he said it was dangerous, Peter protested. You've made it more dangerous, Carcifer said. Don't either of you come any nearer. No one can touch the box now. Does one of you know of a good stout layer of rock where I can go to destroy these eggs? Peter tried not to look chastened. Charmaine remembered her fall from the cliff and how she had nearly landed on big rocks before she started to fly. She did her best to describe to Calcifer where those crags were. Under the cliff, I see, Calcifer said. One of you open the back door, please, and then stand back. Peter hurried to open the door. Charmaine could see he was quite ashamed of what he had done to the glass box. But it won't stop him doing something just as silly another time, she thought. I wish he'd learn. Calcifer hovered over the glass box for a moment, and then whirled to the open door. Halfway through the doorway, he seemed to stick, jerking and trembling, until he gave a mighty heave, doubling himself up like a large blue tadpole, and then slamming himself straight again, and shot forward across the colourful washing. The glass box came loose with a scrape, and a sound like someone throwing wooden planks about, and shot after him. It floated over the yard, eggs and all, following Calcifer's small blue teardrop shape. Peter and Charmaine went to the door and watched the glass box glinting its way up and across the green hillside toward the Lubbock's meadow until it was out of sight. Oh, Charmaine said, I forgot to tell them that Prince Ludovic is a Lubbockin. Is he? Really? Peter said as he shut the door. That must explain why my mother left this country then. Charmaine had never had much interest in Peter's mother. She turned impatiently away and saw that the table was now flat again. That was a relief. She had been wondering what you did with a table that had a square trench in the middle of it. What safety spell did you use? she said. I'll show you, Peter said. I want to have another sight of that castle anyway. Do you think we dare open the window and climb out near to it? No, said Charmaine. But the Lubbock's definitely dead, Peter said. There can't be any harm in it. Charmaine had a very strong feeling that Peter was asking for trouble. How do you know there was only one Lubbock, she said. The encyclopedia said, Peter argued, Lubbock's are solitary. Arguing fiercely about it, they wrangled their way through the inner door and turned left into the corridor. There Peter made a defiant dash for the window. Charmaine dashed after him and held him back by his jacket. Waif dashed after them, squeaking with distress and contrived to tangle herself with Peter's feet so that he fell forward with both hands on the window. Charmaine looked nervously out at the meadow, gleaming peacefully in orange sunset light, where the castle was still squatting beside the burned black patch. It was one of the queerest buildings she had ever seen. There was a flash of light so bright that it blinded them. Instants later, there came the clap of an explosion as loud as the light was bright. The floor beneath them jiggled, and the window blurred in its frame. Everything shook. Through tears of dazzle mixed with blots of blindness, Charmaine thought she saw the castle vibrating all over. With ears fuzzy and deaf, she thought she heard rocks crash and grind and tumble. Clever waif! she thought. If Peter had been outside, he might be dead by now. What do you think that was? Peter asked, when they could almost hear again. Calcifer destroying the Lubbock eggs, of course, said Charmaine. The rocks he went to are straight under the meadow. They both blinked and blinked, trying to clear away blobs of blue and grey and yellow dazzle that would keep floating inside their eyes. They both peered and peered. It was hard to believe it, but nearly half the meadow was now missing. A curved piece, like a huge bite, had gone from the sloping green space. Below that, there must have been quite a landslide. Hmm, said Peter. You don't think he destroyed himself as well, do you? Charmaine said. I hope not. 
They waited and watched. Sounds came back to their ears, almost as usual, apart from a little fizzing. The blots gradually faded from their eyes. After a while, they both noticed that the castle was drifting in a sad, lost way across the meadow toward the rocks at the other end. They waited and watched until it drifted up over the rocks and out of sight along the mountainside. There was still no sign of Calcifer. He probably came back to the kitchen, Peter suggested. They went back there. They opened the back door and peered out among the laundry. But there was no sign anywhere of a floating blue teardrop shape. They went through the living room and opened the front door, but the only blue out there was the hydrangeas. Do far demons die? Peter asked. I have no idea, Charmaine said. As always in times of trouble, she knew what she wanted to do. I'm going to read a book, she said. She sat on the nearest sofa, pulled her glasses up, and picked the magician's journey up off the floor. Peter gave an angry sigh and went away. But it was no good. Charmaine could not concentrate. She kept thinking of Sophie and of Morgan, too. It was quite plain to her that Calcifer was, in some strange way, part of Sophie's family. It would be even worse than losing you, she said to Waif, who had come to sit on her shoes. She wondered if she should go to the royal mansion and tell Sophie what had happened. But it was dark now. Sophie was probably having to have formal supper, sitting opposite the Lubbockan prince with candles and things. Charmaine did not think she dared interrupt another occasion in the mansion. Besides, Sophie was worried sick about that threat to Morgan. Charmaine did not want to worry her more. And perhaps Calcifer would turn up in the morning. He was made of fire, after all. On the other hand, that explosion was enough to blow anything to bits. Charmaine thought of bits of blue flame scattered about inside a landslide. Peter came back into the living room. I know what we ought to do, he said. Yes, Charmaine said eagerly. We ought to go and tell the kobolds about Rollo, Peter said. Charmaine stared, took her glasses off and stared more clearly. What have the kobolds got to do with Calcifer? Nothing, Peter said, rather puzzled. But we can prove that the Lubbock paid Rollo to make trouble. Charmaine wondered whether to spring up and hit him round the head with the magician's journey. Bother the kobolds. We ought to go now, Peter began persuasively, before in the morning, Charmaine said firmly and definitely. In the morning, after we've been up to those rocks to see what happened to Calcifer. But, said Peter, because... Charmaine said, quickly thinking of reasons. Rollo's going to be off somewhere hiding his crock of gold. He ought to be there when you accuse him. To her surprise, Peter thought about this and agreed with her. And we ought to tidy Wizard Norland's bedroom, he said, in case they bring him back tomorrow. You go and do that, Charmaine said, before I throw my book at you, she thought and probably the vase of flowers after that. Chapter 14 Which is full of kobolds again Charmaine was still thinking of Calcifer when she got up next morning. As she came out of the bathroom, she saw that Peter was busily engaged in changing the sheets on Great Uncle William's bed and stuffing the old sheets into a laundry bag. Charmaine sighed. More work. Still, she said to Waif, as she put down the usual bowl of dog food. It keeps him busy and happy while I look for Calcifer. Now, are you coming up to those rocks with me? Waif, as always, was only too pleased to go wherever Charmaine went. After breakfast, she trotted eagerly after Charmaine through the living room to the front door. But they never went to the rocks. As Charmaine put out her hand to the doorknob, Waif, charged out from behind her and burst the door open, and there was Rollo on the doorstep in the act of reaching his small blue hand out for his daily crock of milk. Uttering tiny snarls, Waif sprang upon him, 
got her jaws round Rolo's neck and pinned him to the ground. Peter! Charmaine roared, standing in a pool of spilled milk. Come quickly! We need a bag! She put one foot on Rolo to keep him in place. Bag! Bag! She screamed. Rolo kicked madly and bounced about under her shoe, while Waif let go of him in order to bark. Rolo added to the din by yelling, Help! Murder! Assault! In a strong grating howl, Peter, to do him justice, arrived at a run. He took one look at the scene in the doorway and snatched up one of Mrs. Baker's embroidered food bags, which he managed to get over Rolo's flailing legs before Charmaine could draw breath to explain. Next second, Peter had the bag entirely over Rolo and was holding it up, bulging, twisting and dripping milk, while he tried to reach one of his own pockets. Nice work, he said. Get some string out of that pocket, will you? We don't want him getting away. And when Charmaine had fumbled out a length of purple string from the pocket, he added, Have you had breakfast? Good. Tie the top of the bag really tight. Then take it and hold it fast while I get ready. Then we can go straight there. Oh, <coughs> uttered the bag as Peter passed it over. Shut up, Charmaine said to it, and hung on to the bag with both hands just above the purple string. The bag twisted this way and that, while Charmaine watched Peter drag loops of coloured string from pockets all over his coat. He put red string round his left thumb and green round his right, then purple, yellow and pink round the first three fingers of his right hand, followed by black, white and blue around the first three fingers of his left hand. Waif stood on the doorstep, frayed ears cocked, staring up at the process with interest. Are we going to find the end of the rainbow or something? Charmaine asked. No, but this is how I've memorized the way to the kobolds, Peter explained. Right, shut the front door and let's go. <laughs> shouted the bag. And the same to you, Peter said, leading the way to the inner door. Waif trotted after, and Charmaine followed with the writhing bag. They turned right through the door. Charmaine was too preoccupied to say she thought that was the way to the conference room. She was remembering how easily all the kobolds had vanished and reappeared, and how Rolo himself had sunk into the earth of the mountain meadow. It seemed to her that it was only a matter of time before Rolo sank out of the bottom of the embroidered bag. She kept one hand underneath it, but she was sure that was not enough. With milk dripping between her fingers, she tried to keep Rolo in with a spell. The trouble was, she had no idea how you did this. The only thing she could think of was to use the way she had dealt with Peter's leaking pipe spells. Stay inside. Stay inside, she thought at Rolo, massaging the bottom of the bag. Each massaging produced another muffled yell from the bag, which made her surer than ever that Rolo was getting away. So she simply followed Peter as he turned this way or that, and never noticed how you got to the kobolds at all. She only noticed when they were there. They were standing outside a large, well-lighted cave, full of little blue people rushing about. It was hard to see what most of them were doing, because the view was partly blocked by a very strange object in the entrance. This object looked a little like one of the horse-drawn sleds that people used in High Norland when the winter snows came down and made it impossible to use a cart or a carriage, except that this thing had no way to hitch a horse to it. It had a huge curvy handle at the back instead. It had curls and curvy bits all over it. Dozens of kobolds were working at it, climbing this way and that over it as they worked. Some were lining the inside with padding and sheepskin. Some were hammering and carving. And the rest were painting the outside with curly blue flowers on a gold background. It was going to be very magnificent when it was finished, whatever it was. Peter said to Charmaine, Can I trust you to be polite this time? Can you remember to be tactful at least? I can try, Charmaine said. It depends. Then let me do the talking. Peter told her. He tapped the nearest busy kobold on the back. Excuse me, can you tell me where I can find Timmins, please? Halfway down the cave, the kobold piped, pointing with her paintbrush. 
working on the cuckoo clock. What do you want him for? We've something very important to tell him, Peter said. This attracted the attention of most of the kobolds working on the object. Some of them turned and looked apprehensively at Waif. Waif at once looked sprightly, demure, and lovable. The rest stared at Charmaine and the writhing embroidered bag. Who have you got there? one of them asked Charmaine. Rolo, said Charmaine. Most of them nodded without seeming at all surprised. When Peter asked, Is it all right to go and speak to Timmins? They all nodded again and told him, Go ahead. Charmaine got the feeling that nobody liked Rolo very much. Rolo seemed to know this, because he stopped writhing and made no kind of noise while Peter edged his way past the strange object and Charmaine came after him, holding the bag sideways so as not to get paint on it. What are you making? she asked the nearest kobolds as she went. Commission from the elves, one of them answered. Another added, Going to cost a lot? And a third said, Elves always pay well. Charmaine came out into the cave, feeling none the wiser. The place was huge, and there were tiny kobold children tearing about among the busy adults. Most of the children screamed and ran away when they saw Waif. Their parents mostly moved prudently round to the back of whatever they were working on and went on painting, polishing, or carving. Peter led the way past rocking horses, doll houses, baby chairs, grandfather clocks, wooden settles, and wind-up wooden dolls, until they came to the cuckoo clock. It was unmistakable. It was enormous. Its giant wooden casing stretched all the way up to the magically lighted roof. Its huge clock face was propped up separately, filling most of the wall beside the casing, and the cuckoo for it, which a score of kobolds were diligently covering with feathers, was rather larger than Charmaine and Peter together. Charmaine wondered whoever might want a cuckoo clock that big. Timmins was climbing about in the massive clockwork with a tiny spanner. There he is, Peter said, recognizing him by his nose. Peter went up to the giant works and cleared his throat. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse us. Timmins swung himself round a mighty coil of metal and glowered at them. Oh, it's you, he eyed the bag. Kidnapping people now, are you? Rolo must have heard Timmins's voice and felt he was among friends. <coughs> the bag bellowed. That's Rolo, Timmins said accusingly. That's right, Peter said. We brought him here to confess to you. The Lubbock on the mountain paid him to make trouble between you and Wizard Norland. A beautiful clock of Griff, the bag shouted. But Timmins had gone silvery blue with horror. The Lubbock, he said. That's right, said Peter. We saw him yesterday, asking the Lubbock for his reward. And the Lubbock gave him the crock of gold from the end of the rainbow. Of gold, denied the bag loudly. If we Both of us saw it, Peter said. Let him out, Timmins said. Let him speak. Peter nodded at Charmaine. She took her hand away from the bottom of the bag and stopped doing what she hoped was her spell. Rolo instantly fell through onto the floor, where he sat spitting out milky ends of embroidery wool and old crumbs and glaring at Peter. I really did some magic. I kept him in there, Charmaine thought. You see what they're like, Rolo said angrily. Bag a person up and fill his mouth with stale fuzz so that he can't answer back while they tell lies about him. Well, you can answer now, Timmins said. Did you get a crock of gold from the Lubbock for setting us at odds with the wizard? How could I have done, Rolo asked virtuously. No kobold would be seen dead talking to a Lubbock? You all know that. Quite a crowd of kobolds had gathered around by now, at a safe distance from Waif, and Rolo waved dramatic arms at them. Bear witness, he said. I'm victim of a pack of lies. Go and search his grotto, some of you, Timmins ordered. Several kobolds set off at once. Rolo jumped to his feet. I'll go with you, 
he cried out. I prove there's nothing there. Rollo had gone three steps when Waif seized him by the back of his blue jacket and bumped him to the floor again. She stayed there, teeth in Rollo's jacket, frayed tail wagging with one ear cocked towards Charmaine as if to say, Didn't I do well? You did wonderfully well, Charmaine told her. Good dog. Rollo shouted, Call it off! It's hurting my back! No, you can stay there until they come back from searching your grotto, Charmaine said. Rollo folded his arms and sat looking righteous and sulky. Charmaine turned to Timmins. Is it all right to ask you who wants such a big clock? While we wait, she explained, seeing Peter shaking his head at her. Timmins looked up at the vast pieces of clock. Crown Prince Lodovic, he said with a gloomy sort of pride. He wanted a whopper from Castel Schwa. Gloom swallowed up his pride. He hasn't paid us a penny yet. He never does pay. When you think how rich he is. He was interrupted by the kobolds coming back at a run. Here it is, they shouted. Is this it? It was under his bed. The kobold in front was carrying the crock in both arms. It looked like an ordinary clay pottery crock, the kind someone might use to make a stew in an oven, except that it had a sort of glow around it in faint rainbow colours. That's the one, Peter said. Then what do you think he did with the gold? The kobold asked. What do you mean? What did I do with the gold? Rollo demanded. That their pot was stuffed full. He stopped, realising he was giving himself away. Just now. Take a look if you don't believe me, the other kobold retorted. He dumped the crop down between Rollo's outstretched legs. This is just how we found it. Rollo bent to look inside the pot. He uttered a cry of grief. He plunged his hand into it and brought out a handful of dry yellow leaves. Then he brought out another handful and another, until he had both hands inside the empty crock and was sitting surrounded in dead leaves. It's gone, he howled. It's turned into dead leaves. That lubber cheated me. So you admit the Lubbock paid you to make trouble, Timmins said. Rollo scowled up sideways at Timmins. I don't admit to anything, except that I've been robbed. Peter coughed. <clears throat> I'm afraid the Lubbock cheated him worse than that. It laid its eggs in him as soon as his back was turned. There were gasps from all round. Big-nosed kobold faces stared at Rollo, pale blue with horror, noses and all, and then turned to Peter. It's true. We both saw it, Peter said. Charmaine nodded when they turned to her. True, she said. It's a lie, Rollo howled. You're pulling my leg. No, we are not, Charmaine said. The lubbock stuck out its egg-laying prong and got you in the back, just before you went down into the earth. Didn't you say just now that your back hurt you? Rollo's eyes popped at Charmaine. He believed her. His mouth opened. Waif scrambled hastily away as he began to scream. He threw the pot aside. He drummed his heels in a storm of dry leaves and yelled until his face was navy blue. I'm a goner, he blubbered. I'm walking dead. This thing's breeding inside of me. Help! Oh, please, help me, somebody! Nobody helped him. All the kobolds backed away, still staring in horror. Peter looked disgusted. One lady kobold said, What a disgraceful display! And this seemed so unfair to Charmaine that she could not help feeling truly sorry for Rollo. The elves can help him, she said to Timmins. What did you say? Timmins snapped his fingers. There was sudden silence. Although Rollo continued to drum his heels and to open and shut his mouth, nobody could hear the noise. What did you say? Timmins said to Charmaine. The elves, Charmaine said. They know how to get Lubbock eggs out of a person. Yes, they do, Peter agreed. Wizard Norland had had Lubbock eggs laid in him. That was why they took him away to cure him. An elf came yesterday with the eggs they'd taken out of him. Elves charge high, remarked a kobold by Charmaine's right knee, sounding very impressed. 
I think the king paid, Charmaine said. Hush! Timmins's brow was wrinkling right down into his nose. He sighed. I suppose, he said, we can give the elves their sled chair for nothing in exchange for them curing Rolo. Curses! That's two commissions we won't get paid for now. Put Rolo to bed, some of you, and I'll talk to the elves. And I warn all of you again not to go near that meadow. Oh, that's all right now, Peter said cheerfully. The Lubbock's dead. The fire demon killed it. What? shrieked all the other kobolds. Dead? they clamoured. Really? You mean the fire demon that's visiting the king? Did he actually kill it? Yes. Really? Peter shouted through the noise. He killed the Lubbock, and then he destroyed the eggs the elf brought. And we think he destroyed himself too, Charmaine added. She was fairly sure none of the kobolds heard her. They were all too busy dancing, cheering, and throwing their small blue hats into the air. When the noise had died down a little, and four sturdy kobolds had carried Rollo away, still soundlessly kicking and screaming, Timmin said seriously to Peter, That Lubbock kept all of us in fear, it being the parent of the crown prince and all. What can we give the fire demon to show our gratitude, do you think? Put Wizard Norland's kitchen taps back, Peter said promptly. That, said Timmins, goes without saying. It was Rollo's doing, they were taken away. I meant... What can mere kobolds do for a fire demon that it can't do for itself? I know, Charmaine said. Everyone was respectfully quiet as she went on. Calcifer and his, uh, family were trying to find out where all the king's money keeps disappearing to. Can you help them do that? There were murmurs from all round Charmaine's knees of, Easy, that is, and that's no problem and quite a ripple of laughter, as if Charmaine had asked a stupid question. Timmins was so relieved that his brow unwrinkled entirely, making his nose and his whole face twice as long. That is easy to do, he said, and costs nothing. He glanced across to the other side of the cave, where at least sixty cuckoo clocks hung, all wagging their pendulums in sixty different rhythms. If you come with me now... I think we should be just in time to see the money going. Are you sure the fire demon would be pleased by this? Absolutely, Charmaine said. Then follow me, please, Timmin said. He led the way toward the back of the cave. Wherever they were going to turned out to be quite a long walk. Charmaine became as confused as she had been on the way to the kobold's cave. They were in half-dark the whole distance and the roots seemed to be all bends and sharp turns and hairpin corners. Every so often Timmins would say, Three short steps and turn right, or count eight human-sized steps and turn left, then sharp right, then left again. And this went on for so long that Waif became tired out and whined to be picked up. Charmaine carried her for what seemed more than half the way. I must explain that the kobolds here belong to a different clan, Timmins said, when at last there seemed to be a little daylight ahead. I like to think that my clan would have managed better than they do. Then before Charmaine could ask what he meant, he went into a flurry of sharp rights and slow lefts, with a couple of zigzags thrown in, and she found they were at the end of an underground passage in cool green daylight. Marble steps, all greened over with mildew, led up into some bushes. The bushes must once have been planted on either side of the steps, but they had grown to fill the space entirely. Waif began to growl, sounding like a dog twice her size. Hush, Timmins whispered. No noise at all from here onward. Waif stopped growling at once, but Charmaine could feel her small, hot body throbbing with hidden growls. Charmaine turned to Peter to make sure he had the sense to keep quiet too. Peter was not there. There was only herself, Waif and Timmins. Charmaine, wholly exasperated, knew just what had happened. Somewhere along the confusing way when Timmins had said, Turn left, Peter had turned right, or the other way round. Charmaine had no idea at what point this had happened, but she knew it had. Never mind, she thought. 
he has enough coloured string round his fingers to find his way to Ingery and back. He'll probably arrive at Great Uncle William's house long before I do. So she forgot about Peter, and concentrated on tiptoeing up the slippery mildewed steps, and then on peering out from among the bushes without rustling so much as one leaf. There was blazing sunlight beyond, blazing on very green, very beautifully kept grass, with a blindingly white garden path beyond that. The path led up between trees that had been carved into knobs and points and cones and discs, like a lesson in geometry, to a small storybook palace, one that had many small pointed towers with little blue roofs. Charmaine recognised it as Castel Schwa, where Crown Prince Ludovic lived. She was slightly ashamed to realise that it was the building she always thought of when any book she was reading mentioned a palace. I must be very unimaginative, she thought. Then, no. Whenever her father made shortbreads to sell in boxes for May Day, a picture of Castel Schwa always appeared on the top of the box. Castel Schwa was, after all, the pride of High Norland. No wonder it was so far to walk, she thought. We must be halfway down the Norland Valley here, and it still is my idea of a perfect palace, so there. Footsteps crunched on the hot white path, and Prince Ludovic himself appeared, magnificent in white and azure silk, sauntering toward the palace. Just before he was level with the bush where Charmaine was, he stopped and turned. Come along, can't you? he said angrily. Get a move on! We're trying, Highness, piped a small, panting voice. A line of kobolds trudged into view, each bowed down under a knobby leather sack. They were all more greyish-green than blue, and looked most unhappy. Some of the unhappiness may have been due to the sunlight, for kobolds preferred to live in the dark. But Charmaine thought their colour looked more like bad health. Their legs wobbled. One or two were coughing badly. The last one in the row was so unwell that he stumbled and fell down, dropping his sack, which spilled a scatter of gold coins across the blazing white path. At this, the colourless gentleman strode into view. He advanced on the fallen kobold and started kicking him. He did not kick particularly hard, nor did he look particularly cruel. It was more as if he was trying to get a machine going again. The kobold scrambled about under the kicks, desperately picking up gold coins, until he had them all back in the sack and managed to stagger to his feet again. The colourless gentleman left off kicking him and came to stroll beside Prince Ludovic. "'It's not as if it was even a heavy load,' he said to the prince. "'It's probably the last. They've no more money left, unless the king sells his books.' Prince Ludovic laughed. He'd rather die than do that, which suits me, of course. We'll have to think of some other way to get money, then. Castle Joire is so dashed expensive to run. He looked back at the trudging, wobbling kobolds. Move along there, will you? I have to get back to the royal mansion for tea. The colourless gentleman nodded and strode back to the kobolds, ready to start kicking again, and the prince waited for him, saying, Mind you! If I never see another crumpet in my life, it will be too soon for me. The kobolds saw the colourless gentleman coming and did their best to hurry. All the same, it seemed an age to Charmaine until the procession was out of sight and she could no longer hear their footsteps crunching. She kept her arms tight round the throbbing waif, who seemed to want to jump down and chase the procession, and looked down through the leaves at Timmins. Why haven't you told anyone about this before? Why didn't you at least tell Wizard Norland? Nobody asked, Timmins said, looking injured. No, of course nobody asked, Charmaine thought. This was why Rollo was paid to make the kobolds angry with Great Uncle William. He'd have got round to asking them in the end if he hadn't been ill. She thought it was just as well that the Lubbock was dead. If it was Prince Ludovic's parent, as Timmins had said, then it had probably meant to kill the crown prince and rule the country instead of him. 
It had more or less told her so, after all. But that still leaves Prince Ludovic to deal with, she thought. I really have to tell the king about him. It seems a bit hard on those kobolds, she said to Timmins. It is, Timmins agreed. But they have not asked for help yet. And, of course, it never occurred to you to help them without being asked, did it? Charmaine thought. Honestly, I give up. Can you show me the way home? she asked. Timmins hesitated. Do you think the fire demon will be glad to know the money goes to Castel Chouard? he asked. Yes, Charmaine said. Or his family will. Chapter 15 In Which the Child Twinkle is Kidnapped Timmins rather grudgingly took Charmaine the long, confusing way back to the kobold's cave. There, he said cheerfully, You'll know the way from here, and disappeared inside the cave, leaving Charmaine alone with Waif. Charmaine did not know the way from there. She stood beside the object that Timmins had called a sled chair for several minutes, wondering what to do, and watching kobolds painting and carving and upholstering the object, and never sparing Charmaine a glance. At length, it occurred to her to put Waif down on the ground. Show me the way to Great Uncle William's house, Waif, she said. Be clever. Waif trotted off with a will, but Charmaine soon began seriously to doubt that Waif was being clever. Waif trotted, and Charmaine walked, and they turned left, and then right, and right again, for what seemed hours. Charmaine was so busy thinking about what she had discovered that several times she missed the moment when Waif turned left or right and had to wait, standing in the near dark, shouting, Waif! Waif! until Waif came back and found her. Quite probably Charmaine doubled the distance like this. Waif began toiling and panting with her tongue hanging out longer and longer, but Charmaine did not dare pick her up in case they never got home at all. She talked to Waif instead to encourage them both. Waif, I must tell Sophie what has happened. She must be worrying about Carcifer by now, and I must tell the king about the money too. But if I go to the royal mansion as soon as I get home, horrible Prince Ludovic will be there pretending to like crumpets. Why doesn't he like them? Crumpets are nice. Because he's a lubberkin, I suppose. I don't dare tell the king in front of him. We'll have to wait to go until tomorrow, I think. When do you think Prince Ludovic means to leave? Tonight? The king did tell me to come back in two days, so Ludovic should be gone by then. If I get there early, I can speak to Sophie first. Oh dear, I've just remembered. Carcifer said they were going to pretend to leave, so we may not find Sophie there. Oh, Waif, I wish I knew what to do. The more Charmaine talked about it, the less she knew what to do. In the end, she was too tired to talk, and just stumbled after the pale shape of the limping, panting Waif pattering along in front of her, until at long last Waif barged a door open, and they were in Great Uncle William's living room, where Waif gave a moan and fell over on her side, breathing in hundreds of quick little gasping breaths. Charmaine stared out of the windows at the hydrangeas, all pink and purple in sunset light. We've been all day, she thought. No wonder Waif's so tired. No wonder my feet hurt. At least Peter should be home by now, and I do hope he's got supper ready. Peter, she shouted. When there was no answer, Charmaine picked Waif up and went into the kitchen. Waif feebly licked Charmaine's hand in gratitude for not having to walk a step farther. Here the sunset light was falling on the zigzags of pink and white washing, still hanging, gently flapping in the yard outside. There was no sign of Peter. Peter! Charmaine called. There was no answer. Charmaine sighed. Evidently Peter had got thoroughly lost, even worse than she had, and there was no knowing when he would turn up now. Too many pieces of coloured string, Charmaine muttered to Waif as she tapped the fireplace for dog food. Stupid boy. She felt far too tired to do any cooking. When Waif had eaten two dishes of food and drunk the water Charmaine fetched from the bathroom, Charmaine staggered into the living room 
and had afternoon tea. After some thought, she had afternoon tea a second time. Then she had morning coffee. Then she wondered whether to go to the kitchen and have breakfast, but found she was too tired and picked up a book instead. A long time later, Waif woke her up by climbing on the sofa beside her. Oh, bother this, Charmaine said. She went to bed without even trying to wash and fell asleep with her glasses still on her nose. When she woke next morning, she could hear that Peter was back. There were bathroom noises and footsteps, and the sound of doors opening and shutting. He sounds awfully brisk, Charmaine thought. I wish I did. But she knew she really had to get to the royal mansion today, so she groaned and got up. She dug out her last set of clean clothes and took such great care washing and doing her hair that Waif arrived anxiously from somewhere to fetch her. Yes, breakfast. All right, I know, Charmaine said. The trouble is, she admitted as she picked Waif up, I'm scared of that colourless gentleman. I think he's even worse than the prince. She shoved the door open with one foot, turned, and turned left into the kitchen, where she stopped and stared. A strange woman was sitting at the kitchen table calmly eating breakfast. She was the kind of woman who you know at once is completely efficient. She had efficiency all over her narrow sun-weathered face and competence all over her strong, narrow hands. Those hands were busy efficiently cutting up a mighty pile of pancakes in syrup and slicing the stack of crispy bacon beside it. Charmaine stared, both at the pancakes and the woman's gypsy-like clothes. She wore bright, faded flounces all over and a colourful scarf across her faded, fairish hair. The woman turned and stared back. Who are you? They both said at once, the woman with her mouth full. I'm Charmaine Baker, Charmaine said. I'm here to look after Great Uncle William's house while he's away being cured by the elves. The woman swallowed her mouthful. Good, she said. I'm glad to see he left someone in charge. I didn't like to think of the dog being left all alone with Peter. She's been fed, by the way. Peter is not a dog person. Is Peter still asleep? Uh, said Charmaine. I'm not sure. He didn't come in last night. The woman sighed. He always vanishes as soon as I turn my back, she said. I know he must have got here safely. She waved a fork loaded with pancake and bacon at the window. That washing out there has Peter all over it. Charmaine felt her face go hot and red. Some of it was my fault, she admitted. I boiled a robe. Why do you think it was Peter? Because, said the woman, he has never been able to get a spell right in his life. I should know. I'm his mother. Charmaine was rather shaken to realise she was talking to the witch of Montalbino. She was impressed. Of course Peter's mother is hyper-efficient, she thought. Oh, but what is she doing here? I thought you'd gone to Ingory, she said. I had, said the witch. I got as far as Strangia when Queen Beatrice told me that Wizard Howl had gone to High Norland. So back I came across the mountains and dropped in on the elves, where they told me that Wizard Norland was with them. I was extremely alarmed then, because I realised that Peter was probably all alone here. I'd sent him here to be safe, you see. I came here at once. I think Peter was safe, Charmaine said. Or he was until he got lost yesterday. He'll be safe now that I'm here, the witch said. I can feel he's somewhere quite near, she sighed. I suppose I'll have to go and look for him. He doesn't know his right hand from his left, you see. I know, Charmaine said. He uses coloured string. He's quite efficient, really. But she thought, as she spoke, that to someone as super-efficient as the Witch of Montalbino, Peter was bound to seem as hopeless as Peter thought Charmaine herself was. Parents, she thought. She put Waif on the floor and asked politely, Excuse me for asking, but how did you get the breakfast spell to send you those pancakes? By giving the right order, of course, said the witch. 
Want some? Charmaine nodded. The witch flicked efficient fingers toward the fireplace. Breakfast, she commanded, with pancakes, bacon, juice, and coffee. The loaded tray appeared at once, with a most satisfactory heap of pancakes trickling in syrup in the center of it. See, said the witch. Thank you, Charmaine said gratefully, taking hold of the tray. Waif's nose tilted up at the smell, and she ran round in little circles, squeaking. It was clear that, to Waif, being fed by the witch did not count as proper breakfast. Charmaine put the tray on the table and gave Waif the crunchiest piece of bacon. That's an enchanting dog you've got there, the witch remarked, going back to her own breakfast. She is rather sweet, Charmaine admitted, as she sat down and began to enjoy the pancakes. No, I didn't mean that, the witch said impatiently. I never gush. I meant that is what she is, an enchanting dog. She ate more pancake and added with her mouth full, Enchanting dogs are quite rare and very magical. This one is doing you a great honour by adopting you as her human. I'm guessing that she even changed her sex to match yours. I hope you appreciate her as you should. Yes, said Charmaine. I do. And I'd almost rather have breakfast with Princess Hilda, she thought. Why does she have to be so severe? She went on with her breakfast, remembering that Great Uncle William had seemed to think that Waif was a male dog. Waif had seemed to be a male dog at first. Then Peter had picked her up and said she was female. I'm sure you're right, Charmaine added politely. Why is Peter not safe here on his own? He's my age, and I am. I imagine, the witch said dryly, that your magic works rather better than Peter's. She finished her pancakes and went on to toast. If Peter can possibly bungle a spell, he will, she asserted, buttering the toast. Don't tell me, she said, taking a large crunchy bite, because I won't believe you that your magic doesn't do exactly what you mean it to, however you do it. Charmaine thought of the flying spell and the plumbing spell and then of Rollo in the bag and said, Yes through a mouthful of pancake. I suppose... Whereas, the witch interrupted, Peter is just the opposite. His method is always perfect, but the spell always misfires. One of my reasons for sending him to Wizard Norland was that I hoped the wizard could improve Peter's magic. William Norland owns the Boke of Palimpsest, you see. Charmaine felt her face hotting up again. Ah, uh, she said passing Waif half a pancake. What does the bulk of Palimpsest do, then? That dog will be too fat to walk if you go on feeding her like that, said the witch. The bulk of Palimpsest gives a person the freedom to use all the magics of earth, air, fire, and water. It only gives fire if the person is trustworthy, and of course the person has to have magical ability in the first place. Her severe face showed just a trace of anxiety. I think Peter has the ability. Charmaine thought. Fire. I put the fire out on Peter. Am I trustworthy, then? He must have the ability, she told the witch. You can't make a spell go wrong if you can't do magic in the first place. What other reasons made you send Peter here? Enemies, said the witch, somberly sipping her coffee. I have enemies. They killed Peter's father, you know. You mean Lubbox? Charmaine asked. She put everything back on her tray and took a last swig of coffee, preparing to get up and go. There is, said the witch, only the one Lubbock, so far as I know. It seems to have killed all its rivals. But yes... It was the Lubbock that started the avalanche. I saw it. Then you can stop worrying, Charmaine said, standing up. The Lubbock's dead. Calcifer destroyed it the day before yesterday. The witch was astonished. Tell me, she said eagerly. This ends Disc 6. House of Many Ways, Disc 7.
Although she was itching to be off to the royal mansion, Charmaine found she had to sit down, pour herself another cup of coffee, and tell the witch the whole story, not only about the Lubbock and the Lubbock eggs, but also about Rolo and the Lubbock. And this is unfair use of witchcraft, she thought, as she found herself telling the witch how Calcifer seemed to be missing. Then what are you sitting about here for? the witch said. Run along to the royal mansion and tell Sophie at once. The poor woman must be out of her mind with worry by now. Hurry it up, girl. And not even thank you for telling me, Charmaine thought sourly. I'd rather have my mother than Peter's any day, and I'd definitely rather have breakfast with Princess Hilda. She got up and said a polite goodbye. Then, with Waif racing at her heels, she rushed through the living room and down the garden into the road. Lucky I didn't tell her about the conference room way, she thought, pounding along with her glasses bouncing on her chest. Or she'd make me go that way and I'd never get a chance to look for Calcifer. Just before the road bent, she came to the place where Calcifer had exploded the Lubbock eggs. A huge lump of the cliff had fallen off there, sending a hill of boulders almost as far as the road. Several people who looked like shepherds were climbing about on the pile, searching for buried sheep and scratching their heads as if they were wondering what had caused the damage. Charmaine hesitated. If Calcifer was to be found, those people would have found him by now. She dropped to a walk and stared at the heap of broken stone carefully as she passed. There did not seem to be a trace of blue among the rocks or a sign of a flame anywhere. She made up her mind to have a thorough search later and broke into a run again, hardly noticing that the sky was a clear blue and that there was gauzy blue haze over the mountains. It was going to be one of High Norland's rare scorching days. The only way this affected Charmaine was that Waif soon began to look seriously overheated, panting, rolling from side to side as she ran, and hanging her pink tongue out so far that it almost brushed the road. Oh, you! I suppose it was that pancake, Charmaine said, snatching her up and pounding onward. I wish the witch had not said that about you, she confessed as she ran. It makes me worried about liking you so much. By the time she reached the town, Charmaine was as hot as Waif, so hot that she almost wished she had a tongue to hang out like Waif's did. She had to drop to a brisk walk, and even though she took the shortest way, it still seemed to take forever to reach Royal Square. At last she swung round the corner into the square and found her way blocked by a staring crowd. Half the citizens of High Norland seemed to be gathered there to stare at the new building standing a few feet away from the royal mansion. It was almost as tall as the mansion, long and dark and coaly looking, and it had a turret on each corner. It was the castle Charmaine had last seen floating vaguely and sadly away across the mountains. She stared at it in as much amazement as everyone else in the square. How did it get here? People were asking one another as Charmaine tried to push her way toward it. However did it fit? Charmaine looked at the four roads that led into Royal Square and wondered the same thing. None of the roads was more than half as wide as the castle was. But there it sat, solid and tall, as if it had built itself in the square overnight. Charmaine elbowed her way toward it with growing curiosity. As she came close under its walls, blue fire leapt from one of the turrets and plunged toward her. Charmaine ducked. Waif wriggled. Someone screamed. Everyone in the crowd backed away in a hurry and left Charmaine standing there on her own, facing a blue teardrop of flame hovering just level with her face. Waif's frayed tail pounded on Charmaine's arm, wagging a greeting. If you're going into the mansion... Calcifer crackled at them. Tell them to hurry it up. I can't keep the castle here all morning. Charmaine was almost too delighted to speak. I thought you were dead, she managed to say. What happened? Calcifer bobbled in the air and seemed a trifle ashamed. I must have knocked myself silly, he confessed. I was under a heap of rocks somehow. 
It took me all yesterday to worm my way out. When I did get out, I had to find the castle. It had gone drifting off for miles. I've only just got it here, really. Tell Sophie. She was supposed to be pretending to leave today and tell her I'm almost out of logs to burn. That should fetch her. I will, Charmaine promised. Are you sure you're all right? Just hungry, Carcifer said. Logs, remember? Logs, Charmaine agreed, and went up the steps to the mansion door, feeling suddenly that life was very much better and happier and freer than it had seemed before. Sim opened the great door to her, surprisingly quickly. He looked out at the castle and the staring crowd and shook his head. Ah, Miss Charming, he said. This is surely becoming a rather difficult morning. I'm not sure that His Majesty is quite ready to begin work in the library yet, but do please to come inside. Thanks, Charmaine said, putting Waif down on the floor. I don't mind waiting. I have to speak to Sophie first anyway. Sophie? Uh, Mrs. Pendragon, that is to say... Sim said as he heaved the door shut. Seems to be some of the difficulty this morning. The princess is highly put out and... But come this way and you will see what I mean. He shuffled away down the damp corridor, beckoning Charmaine to follow. Before they even got to the corner, to the place where the stone stairs came down, Charmaine could hear the voice of Jamal the cook saying, And how is a person to know what to cook? when guests are always leaving and not leaving and then leaving again. I ask you. This was followed by fruity growls from Jamal's dog and quite a chorus of other voices. Sophie was standing in the space below the stairs, holding Morgan in her arms, with Twinkle clinging anxiously and angelically to her skirt, while the fat nursemaid stood by looking useless as usual. Princess Hilda stood by the stairs, more intensely royal and polite than Charmaine had ever seen her, and the king was there too, red in the face and obviously in a right royal rage. One look at all their faces, and Charmaine knew that there was no point in mentioning logs here yet. Prince Ludovic was leaning on the end of the banisters, looking amused and superior. His lady was beside him, looking disdainful, in what was very nearly a ball dress and to Charmaine's dismay, the colourless gentleman was there too, respectfully beside the prince. You wouldn't think he'd just been robbing the king of all his money, the beast, Charmaine thought. I call this an utter abuse of my daughter's hospitality, the king was saying. You had no right to make promises you don't intend to keep. If you were one of our subjects, we would forbid you to leave. Sophie said, trying to sound dignified. I do mean to keep my promise, sire, but you can't expect me to stay when my child has been threatened. If you'll let me take him away to safety first, then I'll be free to do whatever Princess Hilda wants. Charmaine saw Sophie's problem. With Prince Ludovic and the colourless gentleman standing there, she dared not say that she was only pretending to leave. And she did have to keep Morgan safe somehow. The king said angrily, Don't give us any more false promises, young woman. By Charmaine's feet, a waif suddenly began growling. Behind the king, Prince Ludovic laughed and clicked his fingers. What followed took everyone by surprise. The nursemaid and the prince's young lady both burst out of their dresses. The nursemaid became a burly purple person with glistening muscles and bare-clawed feet. The prince's lady's ball dress peeled away to show a thick mauve body in a black leotard that had holes cut in the back to make room for a pair of useless-looking small purple wings. Both lubberkins advanced on Sophie with big purple hands outstretched. Sophie yelled something and whirled Morgan away from the clutching hands. Morgan yelled too in surprise and terror. Everything else was drowned out by the high yapping of Waif and immense fruity growls from Jamal's dog as it charged after the prince's lady. 
Before the dog could get near either Lubbockan, the prince's lady, Little Wings whirring, had dived on Twinkle and snatched him up. Twinkle screamed and flailed blue velvet legs. The nursemaid Lubbockan put herself in front of Sophie to stop her trying to rescue Twinkle. You see, Prince Ludovic said, you are leaving, or your child suffers. Chapter 16 which is full of escapes and discoveries. This, said Princess Hilda, is an outrage. She had got this far when Twinkle somehow got away. He twisted out of the Lubbockan's purple arms and went racing away up the stairs, shrieking, Help! Help! Don't let them touch me! Both Lubbockans pushed Princess Hilda aside and charged upstairs after Twinkle. Princess Hilda reeled into the banisters and clung there, red in the face, and suddenly far from stately. Charmaine found herself racing upstairs after the Lubbockans, shouting, Leave him alone! How dare you! Afterward, she thought it was the sight of Princess Hilda looking like an ordinary person that did it. Down below, Sophie hovered a second and then shoved Morgan into the arms of the king. Keep him safe! She gasped at the king. Then she hauled her skirts up and raced upstairs after Charmaine, shouting, You just stop that! Do you hear? Jamal loyally labored up after them, yelling, Stop! Thief! Stop! Thief! And panting hugely. Behind him clambered his dog, as loyal as its master, uttering huge rasping growls, while Waif ran backward and forward at the bottom of the stairs, making a soprano thunderstorm of barking. Prince Ludovic hung over the banisters opposite Princess Hilda and laughed at the lot of them. The two Lubbockans caught Twinkle near the top of the flight, in a blur of uselessly fanning wings and shiny mauve muscles. Twinkle surged and kicked mightily. For a moment, his blue velvet legs seemed to be big, strong man-sized legs. One big leg landed hard in the nursemaid Lubbockan's stomach. The other came down on the stairs and braced him, while Twinkle's right fist landed on the second Lubbockan's nose with a meaty man-sized smack. Leaving both Lubbockans in a heap on the landing, Twinkle sped nimbly on upward. Charmaine saw him look earnestly backward and down as he whirled onto the next flight of stairs, making sure that she and Sophie and Jamal were still following. They followed, because the two Lubbockans picked themselves up with incredible speed and pelted upward after Twinkle. Charmaine and Sophie pelted upstairs too, and Jamal and the dog toiled on behind. Halfway up that next flight, the Lubbockans caught Twinkle again. Again there were hefty smacking sounds, and Twinkle got loose once more, and once more sped upward into the third flight of stairs. He made it most of the way to the top of those, before the Lubbockans reached him and threw themselves on top of him. All three went down into a walloping, writhing heap of legs, arms, and fluttering purple wings. By this time, Charmaine and Sophie were flagging and nearly out of breath. Charmaine distinctly saw Twinkle's angelic face emerge from the tangle of bodies and watch them carefully. When Charmaine had toiled across the landing and started on that flight, followed by Sophie, who was clutching a stitch in her side, the bundle of bodies suddenly exploded apart. The purple bodies rolled aside, and Twinkle, loose again, went fleeting up the final flight of wooden stairs. By the time the Lubbockans had picked themselves up and started after him, Charmaine and Sophie were not far behind. Jamal and his dog were a long way in the rear. Up the wooden stairs they clattered, all the front five. Twinkle was climbing quite slowly now. Charmaine was fairly sure this was artistic, but the Lubbockans gave shouts of triumph and put on speed. Oh, no, not again, Sophie groaned, as Twinkle banged open the door at the top and shot out onto the roof. The Lubbockans shot out after him, when Charmaine and Sophie toiled their way up there and stared out through the open door while they tried to get their breaths back. They saw the two Lubbockans sitting astride the golden roof. They were about halfway along and looking very much as if they wished they were anywhere else. There was no sign of Twinkle. Now what is he up to? Sophie said. Almost as she said it, Twinkle appeared in the doorway, flushed and laughing angelic laughter, with his golden curls in a wind-blown halo. Come and see what I found, he said gleefully. 
Just follow me. Sophie clutched her side and pointed out at the roof. What about those two? She panted. Do we just hope they fall off? Twinkle grinned enchantingly. Wait and see. He cocked his golden head, listening. Down below, the growling and scrabbling of the cook's dog was getting louder. It had overtaken its master and was now snarling and clattering its way up the wooden stairs, panting horribly. Twinkle nodded and turned toward the roof. He made a small gesture and muttered a word. The two lubbocans perched out there suddenly shrank with an unpleasant squelching sound and became two purplish small flopping things wagging about on the ridge of the golden roof. What? said Charmaine. Twinkle's grin grew, if possible, even more angelic. Squid, he said blissfully. The cook's dog will sell its soul for squid. Sophie said, Eh? Oh, squids! I get you. The cook's dog arrived as she spoke, with its legs going like pistons and drool hanging from its gnarly jaws. It shot out of the door and along the roof like a brown streak. Halfway along, its jaws went snap, crunch, and then snap, crunch again, and the squids were gone. Only then did the dog seem to notice where it was. It froze, with two legs on one side of the roof and two legs stiffly on the other, and whined piteously. Oh, poor thing, Charmaine said. The cook will rescue it, Twinkle said. You two follow me closely. You have to turn left through this door before your foot touches the roof. He stepped through the door leftward and vanished. Oh, I think I understand, Charmaine thought. This was like the doors in Great Uncle William's house, except that it was unnervingly high up. She let Sophie step through first, so that she could catch hold of Sophie's skirt if Sophie went wrong. But Sophie was more used to magic than Charmaine. She stepped left and vanished with no trouble at all. Charmaine had a distinctly wobbly moment before she dared to follow. She shut her eyes and stepped. But her eyes shot open of their own accord as she went, and she had a sideways sliding view of the golden roof giddily blazing past her. Before she could decide to scream Eelf to invoke the flying spell, she was elsewhere, in a warm, triangular space with rafters in the roof. Sophie said a bad word. In the dim light, she had stubbed her toe on one of the many dusty bricks piled around the place. Naughty, naughty, Twinkle said. Oh, shut up, Sophie said, standing on one leg to hold her toe. Why don't you grow up? Not yet. I told you. Twinkle said. We still have Prince Ludovic to deceive. Oh, look! This happened when I was here just now, too. A golden light was spreading over the largest pile of bricks. The bricks picked up the light and glowed golden as well under the dust. Charmaine realized that they were not bricks at all, but ingots of solid gold. To make this quite clear, a golden banner appeared floating in front of the ingots. Old-fashioned letters on it said, Prave the wizard Malakot who hid her the king he called. Ha! Huh, Sophie snorted, letting go of her toe. Malakot must have lisped just like you. Proper soulmates you and he would have been. Same size in swelled heads. He couldn't resist having his name up in lights, could he? I don't need my name up in lights. Twinkle said with great dignity. Tuh! said Sophie. Where are we? Charmaine asked quickly, because it rather looked as if Sophie was going to pick up a golden brick and brain Twinkle with it. Is this the royal treasury? No, under the golden roof, Twinkle told her. Cunning, isn't it? Everyone knows the roof isn't really gold, though nobody thinks of looking for the gold here. He tipped up one golden brick, thumped it on the floor to knock the dust off, and dumped it into Charmaine's hands. It was so heavy that she nearly dropped it. You carry the evidence, he said. I think the king is going to be very glad to see this. Sophie, who seemed to have recovered her temper a little, said, That lisp, it's driving me crazy. I think I hate it even more than I hate those golden curls. But think how useful. Twinkle said. 
Nasty Ludovic tried to kidnap me and forgot all about Morgan. He turned his big blue eyes soulfully up at Charmaine. I had a miserable childhood. Nobody loved me. I think I have a right to try again, looking prettier, don't you? Don't listen to him, Sophie said. It's all a pose. How, how do we get out of here? I left Morgan with the king and Ludovic's down there too. If we don't get back downstairs quickly, Ludovic's going to be thinking of grabbing Morgan any moment now. And Calcifer asked me to tell you to be quick, Charmaine put in. The castle's waiting in Royal Square. I really came to tell you... Before she could finish her sentence, Twinkle had done something that made the dusty loft rotate around them so that they were once more standing beside the open door to the roof. Beyond the door, Jamal was lying on his face along the roof ridge, shaking all over, with one hand stretched out, clutching his dog's left hind leg. The dog was growling horrendously. It hated having its leg held, and it hated the roof, but it was too frightened of falling to move. Sophie said, Howl, he's only got one eye, and he's not balanced at all. I know, Twinkle said. I know, I know. He waved a hand, and Jamal came sliding backward toward the door, towing the snarling dog. I may be dead. Jamal gasped as the two landed in a heap by Twinkle's feet. Why are we not dead? Goodness knows, Twinkle said. Excuse us, we need to see a king about a slab of gold. He went pattering away down the stairs. Sophie raced after him, and Charmaine followed, lumbering rather because of the weight of the gold brick. Down they rushed and down and down again until they swung round the corner at the top of the final flight. They arrived there just at the moment when Prince Ludovic shouldered Princess Hilda aside, barged past Sim, and pulled Morgan out of the king's arms. Bad man! Morgan boomed. He seized Prince Ludovic's beautifully curled hair and dragged. The hair came off, leaving the prince's head smooth, bald, and purple. I told you so! Sophie screamed and seemed to take wing. She and Twinkle raced down the stairs side by side. The prince looked up at them and down at Waif, who was trying to bite his ankle and tried to drag his wig out of Morgan's hands. Morgan was beating Ludovic's face with it, still screaming, Bad man! The colourless gentleman called out, This way, Highness! And the two Lubberkins raced for the nearest door. Not in the library! The king and the princess shouted with one voice. They meant it so much and were so commanding that the colourless gentleman actually stopped, turned, and led the prince off in another direction. This gave Twinkle just time to catch up with Prince Ludovic and hang on to the prince's trailing silken sleeve. Morgan gave a yell of delight and threw the wig down on Twinkle's face, more or less blinding him. Twinkle was towed helplessly along to the next nearest door, with the colourless gentleman sprinting ahead and Waif chasing, barking up a shrill tempest, and Sophie behind Waif shouting, Put him down or I'll kill you! Behind her, the king and the princess gave chase too. I say, this is a bit much, the king called out. The princess simply ordered them to stop. The prince and the colourless gentleman tried to fling themselves and the children through the door and slam it in the faces of Sophie and the king. But the moment it slammed, Waif somehow burst the door open again and the rest of them came chasing through. Charmaine was last, with Sim. By this time, her arms were aching. Can you hold this? she said to Sim. It's evidence. She passed Sim the gold brick while he was saying, Certainly, miss. His hands and arms went right down with the weight of it. Charmaine left him juggling with it and scuttled into what turned out to be the big room with the rocking horses lining the walls. Prince Ludovic was standing in the middle of it, looking very strange with his bald purple head. He was now holding Morgan with one arm across Morgan's neck, and Waif was jumping and dancing round his feet, trying to reach Morgan. The wig was lying on the carpet like a dead animal. You'll do what I say, the prince was saying, or this child suffers. Charmaine's eye was caught by a sudden plunging blue flush from the fireplace. She looked and saw it was Calcifer, who must have come down the chimney in search of logs. 
he settled in among the unlighted wood there with a sigh of pleasure. When he saw Charmaine looking at him, he winked one orange eye at her. Suffers, I say, Prince Ludovic said dramatically. Sophie looked at Morgan wriggling about in the prince's arms and then down at Twinkle, who was just standing there, staring at his fingers, as if he had never seen them before. She glanced across at Calcifer and seemed to be trying not to laugh. Her voice came out wobbly as she said, Your Highness, I warn you, you are making a big mistake. You certainly are, the king agreed, panting and red in the face from the chase. We in High Norland do not as a rule go in for treason trials, but we shall take pleasure in trying you. How can you? the prince demanded. I'm not one of your subjects. I'm a Lubbockan. Then you cannot, by law, be king after my father, Princess Hilda stated. Unlike the king, she was quite cool again, and very royal. Oh, can't I? said the prince. My parent, the Lubbock, says I am to be king. It intends to rule the country through me. It got rid of the wizard so that nothing can stand in our way. You must crown me king at once or this child suffers. I am keeping him as a hostage. Apart from that, what wrong have I done? You've taken all their money, Charmaine called out. I saw you, both you Lubbockans, making the kobolds carry all their tax money to Castel Schwa, and you're to let that little boy go before he strangles. Morgan's face was bright red by then, and he was struggling frantically. I don't think Lubbockans have any real feelings, she thought, and I don't understand why Sophie thinks it's so funny. My goodness, said the king. So that's where it all went, Hilda. There's one puzzle solved at any rate. Thank you, my dear. Prince Ludovic said disgustedly. Why are you so pleased? Didn't you listen to me? He turned to the colourless gentleman. He'll be offering us all crumpets next. Get on and work your spell. Get me out of here. The colourless gentleman nodded and spread his faintly purple hands out in front of him. But that was the moment when Sim shuffled in with the gold brick in his arms. He shuffled swiftly across to the colourless gentleman and dropped the gold brick on the gentleman's toe. After that, a lot of things happened very quickly. As the gentleman, now purple with agony, hopped about yelling, Morgan seemed to arrive at his last gasp. His arms waved in a strange convulsive pattern, and Prince Ludovic found himself trying to carry a tall, full-grown man in an elegant blue satin suit. He dropped the man, who promptly turned round and hit the prince in the face. How dare you do that? the prince screamed. I'm not used to it. Bad luck, said Wizard Howl, and hit him again. This time Prince Ludovic caught his foot in the wig and sat down with a thump. Only language a lover can understand, the wizard remarked over his shoulder to the king. Had enough, Ludy, old boy. At the same time, Morgan, who seemed to be wearing Twinkle's blue velvet suit, very crumpled and much too big for him, rushed at the wizard, booming, Dad, Dad, Dad! Oh, I see, Charmaine thought. They changed places somehow. That's pretty good magic. I'd like to learn how you do that. She wondered, while she watched the wizard carefully keeping Morgan away from the prince, why Howl had wanted to be prettier than he was. He was most people's idea of a very handsome man. Although she thought his hair was perhaps a little unreal, it fell over his blue satin shoulders in improbably beautiful flaxen curls. But also at the same time, Sim stood back while the colourless gentleman hopped about in front of him and seemed to be trying to make a formal announcement of some kind. But Morgan was raising such a clamour, and Waif was barking so hard that all anyone could hear was, Your Majesty and Royal Highness. While Sim was speaking, Wizard Howl looked across at the fireplace and nodded. There was something that happened then between the wizard and Calcifer that was not exactly a flash of light, and not exactly a flash of invisible light either. While Charmaine was still trying to describe it to herself, Prince Ludovic humped into himself and vanished downward. So did the colourless gentleman. In their places, 
were two rabbits. Wizard Howe looked at them and then at Calcifer. Why rabbits? he asked, swinging Morgan up into his arms. Morgan at once stopped yelling and there was a moment of silence. All that hopping about, Calcifer said. It put me in mind of rabbits. The colourless gentleman was still hopping about but he was now hopping as a large white rabbit with bulging purple eyes. Prince Ludovic, who was a pale fawn colour with even bigger purple eyes, seemed too astonished to move. He twitched his ears and wobbled his nose. This was when Waif attacked. Meanwhile, the visitors Sim had been trying to announce were already in the room. Waif killed the fawn-coloured rabbit almost under the runners of the kobold's painted sled chair, which was being pushed by the witch of Montalbino. Great Uncle William, rather pale and thin but evidently much better, was propped on a pile of blue cushions inside the chair. He and the witch and Timmins, who were standing on the cushions, all leaned over the chair's carved blue side to watch Waif give a tiny snarl and tossed the fawn-coloured rabbit sideways by its neck, and then, with another miniature snarl, hurl it across her back to land with a flump, dead on the carpet. Good gracious, said Wizard Norland, the King Sophie and Charmaine. I'd have thought Waif was too small to do that. Princess Hilda waited for the rabbit to land, and sailed across to the sled chair. She ignored grandly, the frantic rushing and scrambling as Waif chased the white rabbit round and round the room. "'My dear Princess Matilda,' the princess said, holding both hands out to Peter's mother, "'what a long time it is since we've seen you here. I do hope you mean to make us a long visit.' "'That depends,' the witch said dryly. "'My daughter's second cousin,' the king explained to Charmaine and Sophie." "'Prefers to be called the Witch of Somewhere, usually. "'Always gets irritated if anyone calls her Princess Matilda. "'My daughter makes a point of it, of course. "'Hilda doesn't hold with inverted snobbery.' "'By this time, Wizard Howl had hoisted Morgan up onto his shoulders "'so that they could both watch as Waif cornered the White Rabbit "'behind the fifth rocking horse along. "'There was some more tiny snarling.' Presently, the white rabbit's corpse came flying out across the rockers, dead and limp. Hooray! Morgan boomed, beating his fists on his father's flaxen head. Hal rather hastily hoisted Morgan down and handed him on to Sophie. Have you told them about the gold yet? he asked her. Not yet. The evidence got dropped on someone's foot, Sophie said, taking firm charge of Morgan. Tell them now. Hal said, there's something else that's strange here. He bent down and caught Waif as she trotted back to Charmaine. Waif squirmed and whined and craned and did everything she could to make it clear that it was Charmaine she wanted to go to. Shortly, shortly, Hal said, turning Waif around in a puzzled way. Eventually, he carried her over to the sled chair where the king was jovially shaking Wizard Norland's hand while Sophie showed the gold ingot to them. The witch and Timmins and Princess Hilda all crowded round Sophie, staring and demanding to know where Sophie had found the gold. Charmaine stood in the middle of the room, feeling quite left out. I know I'm being quite unreasonable, she thought. I'm just the same as I always was, but I want Waif back. I want to take her with me when they send me back home to mother. It was obvious to her that Peter's mother was going to look after Great Uncle William now, and where did that leave Charmaine? There was a terrific crash. The walls shook, causing Calcifer to shoot out of the fireplace and hover over Charmaine's head. Then, in very slow motion, a large hole opened in the wall beside the fireplace. The wallpaper peeled away first, followed by the plaster underneath it. Then the dark stones behind the plaster crumbled away and vanished, until nothing was left but a dark space. Finally, not in slow motion at all, Peter shot backward through the hole and landed lying in front of Charmaine. 
Hole, boomed Morgan, pointing. I think you're right, Calcifer agreed. Peter did not seem in the least put out. He looked up at Calcifer and said, So you're not dead, then? I knew she was making a stupid fuss. She's never sensible about things. Oh, thank you, Peter, Charmaine said. And when have you ever been sensible? Where have you been? Yes, indeed, said the Witch of Montalbino. I'd like to know that, too. She pushed the sled chair right up to Peter, so that Great Uncle William and Timmins were gazing down on Peter along with everyone else, except for Princess Hilda. Princess Hilda was looking ruefully at the hole in the wall. Peter did not seem worried at all. He sat up. Hello, Mum, he said cheerfully. Why aren't you in Ingery? Because Wizard Howl is here, said his mother. And you? I've been in Wizard Norland's workshop, Peter said. I went there as soon as I gave Charmaine the slip. He waved his hands with the rainbow of strings tied round his fingers to show how he got there. But he gave Wizard Norland a slightly anxious look. I've been very careful in there, sir. Really? Have you indeed, said Great Uncle William, looking at the hole in the wall. It seemed to be slowly healing up. The dark stones were closing gently in toward the middle of it, and the plaster was growing across after the stones. And what were you doing there for a whole day and a night, may I ask? Divining spells, Peter explained. They take ages. It was lucky you had all those food spells in there, sir, or I'd have been really hungry by now. And I used your camp bed. I hope you don't mind. By the look on Great Uncle William's face, it was clear that he did mind. Peter added hurriedly, But the spells worked, sir. The royal treasure must be here where we all are, because I told the spell to take me to wherever it was. And so it is, said his mother. Wizard Howl has already found it. Oh, said Peter. He looked very cast down, but then he brightened up. I did a spell that worked then. Everyone looked at the slowly healing hole. The wallpaper was now moving softly in across the plaster, but it was obvious that the wall would never be quite the same again. It had a soggy, wrinkled look. I'm sure this is a great comfort to you, young man, Princess Hilda said bitterly. Peter looked at her blankly, obviously wondering who she was. His mother sighed. Peter, this is Her Highness Princess Hilda of High Norland. Perhaps you would be good enough to get up and bow to her and to her father, the king. They are, after all, near relations of ours. How come? Peter asked, but he scrambled to his feet and bowed in a very mannerly way. My son, Peter, said the witch, who is now most probably heir to your throne, sire. Pleased to meet you, my boy, the king said. This has all become very confusing. Won't somebody give me an explanation? I will give you one, sire, the witch said. Perhaps we should all sit down, the princess suggested. Sim, be good enough to remove these two, er, uh, dead rabbits, please. Very good, ma'am, Sim said. He shuffled rapidly about the room, gathering up the two corpses. He was clearly so anxious not to miss whatever the witch was going to say that Charmaine was sure he simply dumped the rabbits outside the door. By the time he hurried back into the room, everyone had settled onto the grand but faded sofas except for Great Uncle William, who lay back on his cushions looking thin and weary, and Timmins, who sat himself on a cushion beside Great Uncle William's ear. Calcifer went back to Roost in the Great. Sophie took Morgan on her knee, where Morgan put his thumb in his mouth and went to sleep, and Wizard Howl at last handed Waif back to Charmaine. He did it with such a dazzlingly apologetic smile that Charmaine felt quite flustered. I like him much better as a grown-up man, she thought. No wonder Sophie was so annoyed with Twinkle. Waif, meanwhile, squeaked and bounced and put her paws on Charmaine's dangling glasses in order to lick her chin. Charmaine rubbed Waif's ears and stroked the frayed hair on the top of Waif's head while she listened to what Peter's mother had to say. As you may know, the witch said, I married my cousin Hans Nicholas, who was at that time 
third in succession to the throne of High Norland. I was fifth, but as a woman, I didn't really count. And besides, the only thing I wanted in the world was to be a professional witch. Hans was not interested in being king either. His passion was for climbing mountains and discovering caves and new passes among the glaciers. We were quite content to leave our cousin Ludovic to be heir to the throne. Neither of us liked him, and Hans always said Ludovic was the most selfish and unfeeling person he knew. But we both thought that if we went away and showed we had no interest in the throne, he wouldn't bother us. So, we moved to Montalbino, where I took up office as witch, and Hans became a mountain guide. And we were very happy, until just after Peter was born, when it became dreadfully plain that our other cousins were dying like flies, and not only dying, but also said to be wicked, and dying because of their wickedness. When my cousin, Isola Matilda, who was the kindest and gentlest of girls, was killed, while apparently attempting to murder someone, Hans became positive that Ludovic was doing it, systematically killing off all the other heirs to the throne, he said, and giving us all a bad name while he does it. I became simply terrified for Hans and for Peter. By that time, Hans was next heir after Ludovic, and Peter came after that. So I got out my broomstick put Peter into a sling on my back, and flew all the way down to Ingery to consult Mrs. Pentstemon, who had trained me as a witch. I believe, the witch said, turning to Hal, that she trained you too, Wizard Hal. Hal gave her one of his scintillating smiles. That was much later. I was her very last pupil. Then you know that she was the best, said the witch of Montalbino. You agree? Hal nodded. You could trust everything she told you, the witch went on. She was always right. Sophie nodded too at this a little ruefully. But when I consulted her, said the witch, she was not sure that there was anything I could do, except take Peter and go very far away. In echo, she thought. I said, but what about Hans? And she agreed I was right to be worried. Give me half a day, she said, to find an answer for you. And she went and shut herself into her workroom. Less than half a day later, she came out almost in a panic. I'd never seen her so upset before. My dear, she said, your cousin Ludovic is a vile creature called a Lubbockan, offspring of a Lubbock that roams the hills between High Norland and Montalbino, and he is doing just what your hand suspected he was doing, no doubt with the help of that Lubbock. You must hurry home to Montalbino at once. Let us pray you get there in time. And on no account tell anyone who this little lad of yours is. Don't tell him or anyone else, or the Lubbock will try to kill him too. Oh, is that why you never told me all this before? Peter said. You should have done. I can look after myself. That, said his mother, is exactly what poor Hans thought too. I should have made him come to Ingory with us. Don't interrupt, Peter. You nearly made me forget the last thing Mrs. Pentstemon said to me, which was, There is an answer, my dear. In your native land, there is, or was, something called the Elf Gift, belonging to the royal family, which has the power to keep the king safe and the whole country with him. Go and ask the king of High Norland to lend this elf gift to Peter. It will keep him safe. So I thanked her and put Peter on my back again and flew as fast as I could to Montalbino. I meant to ask Hans to come with me to High Norland to ask for the elf gift. But when I got home, they told me Hans was up in the Greta Horns with the mountain rescue team. I had the most horrible premonition then. I flew straight on up into the mountains with Peter still on my back. He was crying with hunger by then, but I didn't dare stop. And I just got there in time to see the Lubbock start the avalanche that killed Hans. The witch stopped here, 
as if she could not bear to go on. Everyone waited respectfully, while she swallowed and dabbed at her eyes with a multicolored handkerchief. Then she shook her shoulders efficiently and said, I put protections round Peter at once, of course, the strongest possible. They've never once been off him. I let him grow up as secretly as possible, and I didn't mind at all when Ludovic began telling people that I was a mad prisoner in Castel Chois. That meant no one knew about Peter, you see. And the day after the avalanche, I left Peter with a neighbour and went to High Norland. You probably remember me coming, don't you? she asked the king. Yes, I do, said the king. But you said nothing about Peter or Hans, and I had no idea it was all so sad and urgent. And of course I hadn't got the elf gift. I didn't even know what it looked like. All you did was to start me off, together with my good friend Wizard Norland here, looking for the elf gift. We've been hunting for it for thirteen years now, and we haven't got very far, have we, William? We've got nowhere at all, Great Uncle William agreed from the sled chair. He chuckled. But people will keep thinking that I'm the expert on the elf gift. Some folks even say that I'm the elf gift, and I guard the king. I do try to guard him, of course, but not like an elf gift would. That's one of the reasons I sent Peter to you, said the witch. It was always possible that the rumors were true, and I knew you could keep Peter safe anyway. I've been looking for that elf gift myself for years, because I thought it could probably get rid of Ludovic. Beatrice of Strangia told me that Wizard Howl of Ingery was better at divination than any wizard in the world, so I went to Ingery to ask him to find it for me. Wizard Howl threw his flaxen head back and began to laugh. And you have to admit that I did find it, he said, most unexpectedly. There it sits, on Miss Charming's lap. What? Waif? said Charmaine. Waif wagged her tail and looked demure. Howl nodded. That's right. Your little enchanting dog. He turned to the king. Don't those records of yours talk about a dog anywhere? Frequently, said the king. But I had no idea. My great-grandfather held a state funeral for his dog when it died, and I simply wondered what all the fuss was about. Princess Hilda coughed gently. Of course, most of our oil paintings have been sold now, she said, but I do remember that a lot of our earlier kings were painted with a dog at their sides. They were generally a little, er, uh, nobler looking than Waif, however. I imagine they come all sizes and shapes, Great Uncle William put in. It looks to me as if the elf gift is something certain dogs inherit and the later kings forgot to breed them properly. Now, for instance, when Waif has her puppies a bit later this year... What? said Charmaine. Puppies? Waif wagged her tail again and looked even more demure. Charmaine pushed Waif's chin up and stared accusingly into her eyes. The cook's dog? she asked. Waif blinked bashfully. Oh, Waif! Charmaine wailed. Goodness knows what they'll look like. We must wait and hope, said Great Uncle William. One of those pups will have inherited the elf gift. But there is one other important aspect to this, my dear. Waif has adopted you, and this makes you High Norland's elf gift guardian. Also, since the Witch of Montalbino here tells me that the Boke of Palimpsest has adopted you too, it has, hasn't it? I, uh, um, it did make me do spells out of it, Charmaine admitted. Then that settles it, Great Uncle William said, nestling contentedly back on his cushions. You come and live with me as my apprentice from now on. You need to learn how to help Waif protect the country properly. Yes, oh, but, Charmaine babbled, 
Mother won't allow me. She says magic's not respectable. My dad won't mind, probably, she added. But my mother... I'll fix her, said Great Uncle William. If necessary, I'll set your Aunt Sempronia on her. Better still, said the king, I'll make it a royal decree. Your mother will be impressed by that. You see, we need you, my dear. Yes, but I want to help you with the books, Charmaine cried out. Princess Hilda gave another of her gentle coughs. I shall be rather busy, she said, redecorating and renovating this mansion. The gold ingot was lying on the carpet by her feet. She gave it a tender prod with one sensible shoe. Now we are solvent again, she said happily. I suggest that you stand in for me in the library with my father twice a week, if Wizard Norland will spare you. Oh, thank you, Charmaine said. And, added the princess, as for Peter. There's no need to concern yourself with Peter, the witch interrupted. I shall be staying with Peter and Charmaine to look after the house, at least until Wizard Norland is back on his feet. Maybe I shall live there permanently. Charmaine, Peter, and Great Uncle William exchanged looks of horror. I see why she got to be so efficient, being left all alone with Peter to protect, Charmaine thought. But if she stays in that house, I'll go back to live with Mother. Nonsense, Matilda, said Princess Hilda. Peter is very much our concern, now that it is clear that he is our crown prince. Peter will live here and commute to Wizard Norland for lessons in magic. You must go back to Montalbino, Matilda. They need you there. And us kobolds will look after the house the way we always used to, Timmins piped. Oh, good, Charmaine thought. I don't think I'm really house-trained yet, and Peter certainly isn't. Bless you, Timmins. Bless you, Hilda, Great Uncle William murmured. The thought of all that efficiency in my house. I shall be fine, Mum, Peter said. You don't have to protect me any more. If you're sure, the witch said, it seems to me now said Princess Hilda, at least as efficiently as the witch. It only remains for us to say goodbye to our kind, helpful, if somewhat eccentric guests, and wave them off in their castle. Come along, all of you. Whoops, said Calcifer, and shot away up the chimney. Sophie stood up, dislodging Morgan's thumb from his mouth. Morgan woke, looked round, saw that his father was there, and looked round some more. His face crumpled up, Dinko, he said. Where Dinko? He started to cry. Now look what you've started, Sophie said to Howl. I can always turn into Twinkle again, Howl suggested. Don't you dare, Sophie said, and marched away into the damp hallway after Sim. Five minutes later, they were all gathered on the front steps of the mansion to watch Sophie and Howl hauling the struggling, crying Morgan through the door of the castle. As the door shut on Morgan's yells of, Dinkle! 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 Charmaine bent and murmured to Waif in her arms. You did protect the country, didn't you? And I never even noticed. By this time, half the people in High Norland were gathered in Royal Square to stare at the castle. They all watched with disbelief as the castle rose slightly into the air and glided toward the road that led southward. It was hardly more than an alley, really. It'll never fit, people said. But the castle somehow squeezed itself narrow enough to drift away along it and out of sight. The citizens of High Norland gave it a cheer as it went. The End You've been listening to House of Many Ways by Diana Wynne-Jones, narrated by Jenny Sterling. This book is copyrighted 2008 by Diana Wynne-Jones. This recording is copyrighted 2009 by Recorded Books.